Being a British guy in 2015 is not easy. 21st century pressures are changing. No way. The way we live. Women are seen as superior to men. The way we love. If you are a Muslim, you cannot be gay. That's as simple as that. Even the way we look. That silicone. Yeah. This is mental. In this series, I'm traveling to the extreme edge. <laughs> of modern British masculinity. I mean, what's your body gonna be like at 30? I'd be lucky to get that. If you know that, then what are you doing? In an era of gay rights, marriage, even parenthood, some Brits still struggle to accept homosexuality. A woman and a woman, and a man and a man, I just don't believe that. The male, the female, even the animals, they are like this. And some call being gay a decision, a bad decision. I'm sorry to cut you, but you're comparing homosexuality to stealing and I'm to... Not an, uh, I'm not equating. I'm not I know, I know, you're comparing. But for those who feel they have no choice, the effects can be devastating. He kicked my bedroom door open. He was like, I want you out of my house by midnight. And we didn't speak for three years. Leaving gay men under attack from their own community. Sometimes I love bottles thrown at my head. I love people saying, oh, you fatty man, go die. And even their own family. My own mother said to me, if you murdered someone, I'd still accept you, but you being gay, I can't accept you for that. Gay marriage became legal in Britain in 2014, but in some black and Asian communities, homosexuality itself remains taboo. South London has the largest population of black men in the UK, and it's my home. So it seems like a good place to start. I'm going to meet uh, a guy called Max today in his barber shop. Now, if you've ever actually been to a black barber's, you'll know that it's the best place for debate. It's the best place for shit talking and talking about something like homosexuality in a black barber's. For me, will will stir up some real honest answers and potentially start a conversation that I've never had or heard in a place like this. Max? Hey. What's going on, brother? How are you doing? Max's parents are from West Africa, just like mine. What age would you say you realised that you were actually a gay man? Um, to be honest, I guess deep down I always knew in the back of my mind, but it wasn't up until the age of 18 that I accepted it within myself. One day I kind of just... I don't know what the trigger was. I just kind of woke up and I was like, yeah, this isn't working for me. Like, I'm, I'm gay. Yeah. How long did it take you to go from that realisation to actually approaching that conversation with your father? Well, I... The, I didn't actually have that conversation with my father. You didn't? No. Right. One day, the pastor of the church came up to me and she, she asked me if I was gay. And at this point in time, my philosophy was, like, I'm not going to tell people, but if somebody asks me, I'm not going to deny it. And I said, yeah. And then she, she asked me if, I, if my dad knew. Yeah. And I said, I haven't told him yet. And at the end of the conversation, she said to me, if you don't tell him, I will. So what, she went on to tell him off she, the back yeah, of you yeah. not taking that week to tell yeah. him. And how did he react? It wasn't great. He kicked my bedroom door open, gave me this long 10 minute lecture, and he was like, I want you out of my house by midnight. And we didn't speak for three years. Max tells me they now talk just two to three times a year. It's fair to say my, my father doesn't know who I am right now. Yeah. Based on your experience, what would you say is most commonplace when it comes to West African parents and how parents react to that news? Do you know what? I think a lot of, a lot of people from, from, from Africa are very religious. Yeah. And I think that's where it starts. Excuse me, auntie, <laughs> where are you from? I'm part of Liberia, Sierra Leone. OK, and how long have you been in the UK? 16 years. 16 years, right, OK. Now, that's your little boy who's getting his hair cut, right? Yeah. What is your attitude towards homosexuality? For instance, if your son came out as gay, how do you think you'd react? It's quite hard, because African people, like you said, something that is a cultural thing. Mm. First and foremost, I will ask my son, why? Because for us, to be quite honest, they think 
it's a big, big saboon for them. Mm. It will be so, so hard, even for me, mm. because in the first place, I don't even get it. Gay, I don't even get it. Excuse me, excuse me, brother. It, it's fairly obvious what your religious beliefs are, but um, culturally, I'm really interested in your point of view. First of all, where are your family from? What's your background? Well, my parents are from St. Lucia. You're West Indian? Yeah, Okay. I'm West Indian. Were they born there and came over? Yeah. And you were born here, I take it? I was it. born here, yeah. And how old are you now? I'm 30 you now. You're 30 years old. What are your views on homosexuality? You to your way, me to my way, but me, I don't agree with this one. A lot of good comes from men and the women, you know, like, like being together, brother, you understand? Not to put it like this way, but even the animals, they are like this, you understand? Like the male, the female, even the plants are like this. You know. What would you do if your daughter actually came home and told you that she was homosexual? I mean, to begin with, I'd be heartbroken. To begin with, I'd be heartbroken, personally. I would have the hope maybe it's a phase, it's something, and... Uh... Does that mean that you believe that homosexuality is something that a person chooses? People are choosing to become... Uh, homosexual. <laughs> what would you say to that? I think it's almost, and no offence to you, but it, it, like, it's probably the most ridiculous thing anyone can say that someone would choose to be gay. If you look at the world we live in, being gay isn't, like, it's, it's, it's never been a good thing. It's never been something easy to do. So why would, why would anyone at any age wake up one day and say, do you know what, I want to be a homosexual so that the people in the street can throw rocks at me and so that I could be rejected by my family? I don't know, because obviously you could be with a woman. That relationship may not have worked out. Maybe she done your head in, maybe this, you know, like she was, you know, she was a bad woman, she oppressed you, you know, she made you feel low, all this stuff. But there's many out here. There's many out here. The good one may have come after this one. Do you think that your versions of happiness can exist side by side? I think so. It's like, if you, if you go to a restaurant with somebody and one person wants to order pizza, <laughs> but the other person wants to have chips, what will make one person happy is the chips. What will make another person happy is the pizza. We can sit at the same table and we can eat. We can probably be in the same restaurant, but he will have his table there and he will be, you know, doing his thing on his table there, and I will be on my table over there. I've always sort of said that the attitude towards the LGBT community in the Afro-Caribbean community are massively different based on, uh, on generation. In talking to Ibrahim, I realised that it's not necessarily the case for, um, for everyone. You know, Ibrahim is only a couple of years younger than me, and his mindset couldn't be any more different, even though he was born and raised here. It's hard to ignore religion in any discussion on homosexuality, especially among black communities in the UK. Seven out of 10 black Britons come from Christian homes, and over a quarter of all churchgoers in London are black. Until the age of nine, I was one of them. My uh, very faint memories of going to church were uh, Pentecostal. So, um, you know, it was lots of singing, lots of dancing. Uh, there were a lot of people catching the Holy Ghost. I'll never forget Auntie Linda catching the Holy Ghost and breaking a chair, that was a good time. Um, <laughs> we're going to a, a Seventh-day Adventist church, which I've never been to before. So um, I don't actually know what to expect. Seventh-day Adventist followers believe in a literal interpretation of the Bible. And they practice what they preach. No smoking, no alcohol, and no gambling. But does that list include being gay? How you doing, sir? How you doing? You all right? Um, I'm here to meet Pastor Michael B. Is that him there? Is that his picture? Yeah. Ah, let's see. What's your name, sorry? Alan. Pardon what? Alan. Alan, nice. And what are you handing out here? You didn't give me one. No, sorry. Why I'm didn't I get one, Alan? Because he was talking to me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here he is. Oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hello. 
Hello. Pastor B. Pastor Michael. Michael B. How you doing? I'm Michael Reggie. Michael Mbui. Michael Mbui. Yes. How you doing? I'm very fine, thank you. Nice to meet you. Uh, yes. Thank you for having us down in your church today. Okay. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, when are you? Uh, when are you going to be up and? Uh, I'm not preaching today. Today, today I'm not? just a supervisor. Yeah, the young people are doing the program today. All oh, right. Yes. Okay. Pastor Michael has a young team that he's training up. The man leading today's service is Pastor Andrew. Nice to meet you too. Nice to meet you. Just out of interest, how old are you? You look quite I'm 27, young. 27. 27? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're going to be up there running things today? Nah, not, not running things, but just giving a little humble word, man. Yeah. Yeah. And so how long have you been doing, um, been doing this then? How long have you been preaching? To be honest, I've been preaching since I was 16 years old. I, I left the church and I came back. You know, when you say up. you left the church, what does that mean? Like in the sense when you're growing up in church, yes. and even though I come here one day a week, during the week I was, I was, you know, otherwise occupied with other things. So Such in the sense, you know, girls, you know, money, drugs, like you name it. Living in an wow. area in London, that's it's almost impossible not to get involved in them things. We need okay. to get this out yeah. of yeah, so no problem. We need, this, we need the preacher in here for Mate, a, a, a preacher that can talk a lot is a good thing, surely. <laughs> That's what you want, isn't it? Nice to meet you both. Yes. There is quite a lot of young people here. There's quite a lot of people under the age of 25 here. I imagine that he's probably a big part of that. My sermons are not, this is just me, like it or leave it, I'm an honest person. I'm breaking it down. The world are seeing God how we present him. People outside, the only God they see is you. And if we show them that God is like this, you can't do this and you can't do that and look at you, you're going to hell. If we show them that that is what God is like, then they're not going to want, don't miss this now, they're not going to want to come to the place where God is. And now God gets the blame for our misrepresentation of him. Andrew isn't what I was expecting. He doesn't talk like the pastors I remember and feels like a typical young guy from South London. And the theme of his sermon, tolerance and acceptance. Because I, Andrew Aaron Asher Fuller, if you didn't know my name, that's my name. And me, I'm being honest, I have fallen so far from grace many a times in my life that I can't come to you and look down on you. Pastor Andrew is amazing, isn't he? Um, I don't think I've ever seen a, uh, a pastor that young speak to a, a congregation this mixed. And he spoke to parents in a way that I've been speaking to my mum for years. <laughs> Uh, and I think it really resonated with people here. It's, um, it's pretty much done now, service is over, people are leaving and um, Pastor Andrew is uh, shaking everyone's hands. So I'm going to get my hand shaken um, and maybe have a chat with him too. But everyone wants to shake Andrew's hand. So I grabbed the chance to have a quick word with the head pastor over lunch. Hello, hello. I've been told to come for some lunch. What do we have today? This looks amazing. Has no, have I the first person to come up? Has no one eaten yet? It's all right. You can oh, no, 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 no. I can't be that one. guy. It's all right. Look, every, see, why would you send me there first? The whole room's no, hungry no, 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 and you send me up there and I'm like, yeah, where's my plate? We're going to sit down there and then we want to have some soup first. Right, okay. some soup for us. Okay, got it, got it. If your daughter, for instance, were to come out, would you still have a relationship with her, do you think? You see, in terms, I think in the home setting, we have a clear understanding of what is acceptable. I may be able to point out to you, you are my child, I love you, but if they were to choose that lifestyle, then they wouldn't be able to live with us. You see, membership of the church is a privilege, not a right. When you become a member of the church, you are committing to a particular way of life that is informed by scripture. If you, along the way, choose to, 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 to live a life different from that, you can't be part of an Adventist faith community. So far, so traditional. But Pastor Michael is from an older generation and moved here from Kenya. Maybe the younger Pastor Andrew, who was born and raised in London like me, thinks like I do. Something that gets sort of whispered about in church, in, in my limited experience, and definitely in talking to religious friends that I have now, is attitude towards sex. Yeah. And issues like homosexuality. What do you believe? 
So I don't believe this, and this is saying that as blunt as possible, I believe we have to go to marriage. You know, I sincerely believe, you know, I've, I've, I've been in... Heterosexual, because gay people can get married now. And that's my point. The truth of the matter is, my sincere belief is that when I have a woman and a woman and a man and a man, no hatred, no animosity, but I just don't believe that mother and father are vital in society. So it's I, a traditional family setup. That yeah, you I strongly in. believe that. You right. know, with all my heart, this is not half. No, I strongly believe that. Acceptance in this church, at least, only seems to go so far. The delivery might be different, but fundamentally, Andrew believes the same as his elders. Um, there's almost, <laughs> there's almost a slim to naught chance of you being accepted by the church if when you come to a church and your pastor is cool, he's got this pretty edgy, crazy background, he's in his 20s and even he can't get past that point. It's estimated that one in 10 people are gay in the UK and one in 300 are transgender, the T in LGBT. So if it's tough being black and gay, I can't help wondering what it must be like to be black and trans. I'm on my way to Burton-on-Trent to find out. I've never actually met a transgender person before and um, I'm really looking forward to meeting Tallulah and, uh, and hearing her story because, I mean, we're not exactly in the biggest of towns and in the biggest of cities, which instantly throws up its own issues, but as well as that, the fact that she's of mixed race and the fact her father is of Caribbean descent, I'm really keen to, to be educated on what her life is actually like. Hello. Hi, hey, okay. how you doing? I'm good, Tallulah. Okay. Nice to meet you. you Tallulah's parents separated when she was three, so she lives with her mum and Grandma Glennis, who is still coming to terms with a new granddaughter. Yes. Nice yes. to meet you, Glennis. Yes. Reggie. How is it having Tallulah as a house guest then? Oh, he's all right. She's all right. I should say. She still can't get to grips. I was going to say. Very nice. It's and very everything. very hard to what you've got to do. Yeah. Just get used to the, yeah, the pronouns and everything. Him, you know, Tallulah. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's pretty hard to ignore the fact that there is <laughs> the entirety of your youth on this yeah. little shelf over here. My God, I was obsessed with <laughs> me as a boy. That was about 15, I think. And that was literally just before I came out at school about my, at the time, the sexuality I was. Mm -hmm. um, so that's them two photos. That one was Sexuality me. you was? Yeah, because when I was at high school, I didn't really have a choice other than to, to come out as gay because there was no kind of education as to what being transgender was about, so nobody understood it. Mm -hmm. So my only option was to come out as gay because I was so feminine, and so I had to come out as, as gay just so people would get off my back. Right. But at that point, you were attracted to, to girls or to no, guys? No, no, no. I've always been, in my head, a straight woman, but to everyone else at the time, because I was attracted, attracted to, to guys, Everyone was just like, well, you must be gay. It was after I left school that I came out yeah. as transgender and started living as a woman. This is how I came out of being, about being... Just in a national Living my life paper. as a woman, yeah. <laughs> so this is it. That's oh. me. All right, what tea you got? Can I get a brew on? A brew, yeah. yeah. See, this is, a, this is a massive indicator of how good a host you are, how good your brew is. I think I'm quite a good host. Oh, really? Yeah. All right. Apparently Libras are, because I'm a Libra. So what were you, uh, what were you called before? You, I was uh, called Aaron training, before. Eh? Aaron. Eh? <laughs> there we go. Oh. Don't be shy. Moment of truth, no pressure. That's a seven and a half out of 10. It's seven and a half? <laughs> no. <laughs> <It's> disgusting. <laughs> I think oh, it's a tan. It's a really good tan. I'll, I'll, I'll give you it an may, eight. I'll it may just an be eight. the water around here. You're not used to it. Where are we headed? To the garden. Now that we're away from her nan, there's one question I've been dying to ask Tallulah. Not to be massively intrusive, but you, you say that you're, you, you haven't had your boobs done, but you no. seem yeah, fairly <laughs> together in that area. Yeah. Um, so what, I mean, I'm what, on what hormones at the minute. I'm on hormones. My boobs are probably about an A. But I wear like a C bra and then stuff it with um, these sticky chicken fillet things. Right. Um, but yeah, it gives me quite a realistic bosom, I think. Yeah. So, what kind of guys do you date now? 
guys. Like, I always end up getting with white guys, but I always get approached more by black guys. So they'll say to me, oh, I'd go there with you in, like, in four years' time once you've had surgery, but I won't go with you now because you've got a dick. That kind of thing. Is there, a, is there a big black community here? I wouldn't say there's a big black community in Burton, but there is a black community, and it's very quite a hard thing for them to get their, their head around. Mm. It's very taboo, isn't it? On the drive up here, I realised just how Asian this area is. Yeah, there's a lot of Muslims very, and a lot of Sikh, yeah. Sikh people. I mean, how, how do they react to you? Not very well, to be fair. Like, I do get quite a lot of death threats from the Asian community. How do those and death threats come? Like, to your face, through the door? Oh, yeah, to my face down the street. I'll be walking down the street sometimes, I'll have bottle, bottles thrown at my head. A lot of people saying, oh, you fucking batty man, go die. Literally saying everything that, that you could think of to try and get a reaction out of me. And I just didn't, I just didn't give in. Why did you choose not to react to that? Just because I'd probably get beaten up if I was to react to it. Mm. And I can't really afford to have my face being broken. I'm not totally surprised Tallulah has had grief from some in the local Asian community. Some Muslims struggle to accept gay people, let alone transsexual ones. Few are willing to talk about it on camera, but there is one online, and it turns out that he's gay himself. Homosexuality is okay and is not wrong. You can't change your sexuality, no matter what you do. The man in the video is Sahil Ahmed, a 23-year-old student from East London. Maybe he can shed some light on how his fellow Muslims view gay people. Have you always been in this, uh, this bit of town? Did you grow up around here? Uh, no, 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 I didn't grow up around here. I grew up uh, in uh, Waltham Forest. Okay. So like, I moved here like a year ago, mm. basically since kind of I moved out of my parents' house and stuff. At what age did you realise that you were, you were gay? Well, I mean, the age I realised I was gay was like literally last year, um, age of 22. So that's when I actually came out to myself. Yeah. And the reason why it took so long is because my religion taught me that being gay is not a thing. Yeah. I was pretty much born into actually a very kind of strict uh, form of Islam. You know, I was basically brought up believing that the West is, you know, the enemy, that the UK is at war with Islam. Even though you were living in yeah, the UK? Yeah, even though I was born here and I was living here. Yeah. And I was, I was just basically like, you know, all the non-Muslims are the enemy and that they wow. want to destroy Islam. And I really believed that. At your most extreme point, what would your view on homosexuality have been? Well, my view would have been that it's, it's disgusting, it's evil, and what you do to gay people is that you throw them off a a tall building and he stoned them to death. And I also kind of believe that I deserved being gay as a punishment from God because I'd done something evil in my life. Wow. All right, I'll be your basket man. Yes, thank you. You get what you need. Yeah. Sahil no longer practices his religion. Fridays used to be prayer day, but today he's having friends over instead. I think cookies are a good you idea, want cookies? right? Cool, yeah. go for it. There you go. He's forced to keep the location of his student flat a secret from his family. Coming out was just the beginning of his ordeal. What was it that um, made you decide to leave home? Basically, when, I, when my parents realised I, um, I was gay... Um, did they, they realise or did you tell them? They, the, way, the way they'd found out is that they'd... Um, using the, the router, they checked my internet history. <laughs> Um, and then when they checked that, they read, okay, um, he's, he's, into, he's into other guys. Um, and then, like... Conclusively. Yeah, yeah, conclusive. Um, so then, basically, like, they called me back home and, and my dad basically said, I know the secret that you've been keeping from us. That was the most dreadful, fear-inducing moment in my life. He's my dad, but he believes that gay people should be killed. They should be stoned to death. Including his own son? Including my own including me, yeah. In, like, the Pakistani community, and there's a very strong shame factor. You know, there's a, the whole thing about honour. So, for example, my own mother said to me, um, if you murdered someone, I'd still accept you. But you being gay, I can't accept you for that. I can't accept that. Was there ever a conversation about curing your homosexuality? Did that ever happen? Oh, yeah, that was actually the, the main reason why I ended up leaving, leaving um, the house. They basically said, the only way you can stay in this house is if you agree to be exorcised, to get the, the demons out of you, because they were convinced that the reason why I'm gay and the reason why I was doubting religion mm. was because I was possessed. And for like the next two months, they would like, you know, recite the Quran over me, uh, make me bathe in holy water. At one point, I almost took my own life in my own in my room. That was when I decided, you know what, I can't stay in this house because if I stay here, I'm 
probably not going to be around for much longer. Sorry, they were out of champagne. Oh, yeah. So we got orange juice. juice. <laughs> How does that work for you guys? So Hill moved into student accommodation. He hasn't spoken to his family for over a year. How important has this uh, circle of friends become to you? The reason why I'm here, actually, like, alive, is because of my friends. And if it wasn't for them, then I don't know where I'd be. But Sir Hill's past still haunts his future. Having sex right now is a bridge too far for me. Like, I would be OK with, like, a, a kind of, like, a, a romantic relationship with another guy. Um, but having sex is something that kind of... I'm not sure if I'm ready to go into that. Um, if I see two guys together kissing or something, like, I'll have, like, this emotional kind of immediate, like, homophobia. It's been so deeply indoctrinated in me from since childhood that it's just, it's hard for me to kind of weed that out and get rid of that and shake that kind of thinking off. I think the most surreal thing about Sahil's story is that it actually happened here in London. I'm flabbergasted that someone is having to go through an exorcism uh, because their parents are disgusted by their nature, by the fact that they're actually a homosexual person. He's now alone. He no longer has a connection to his family, and, you know, the thing that seems most painful for him is losing that relationship with his mama and mother and his, and his younger siblings. That's just really sad. All down to the fact that he is, he is being himself. Islam is the fastest growing religion in the UK. There are now over 1.5 million Muslims under the age of 25. With numbers like that, it's hard to ignore the influence imams can have on young minds like Sahil's. We contacted over 200 mosques to find someone to speak with me on camera. And in the end, only one imam agreed. Mohammed is 29 and from Edinburgh, but he's having to meet me independently without the support of his mosque. So, Mohammed, what are your beliefs when it comes to homosexuality? My beliefs are the same beliefs that my religions have. When it comes to these issues, obviously you go back to the sources that you have and you try to find your answers in it. Okay, so what would your answer be? Uh, I personally believe that it's an unnatural manifestation of a natural desire. Yep. In Islam, we are told that this is not something that can become a feeling. This is something that is unnatural. And if it's something that is in you, then you can tackle it, you can deal with it. What would you say the general attitude in your mosque is towards homosexuality? Honestly speaking, people don't speak about it. Uh, I've received some anonymous emails. They never mention their name, probably out of shyness. So you've had somebody at your mosque approach you about their own homosexual feelings. What was your reaction to that? If you really trust Allah, if in his heart he has a feeling for Allah which is more stronger than any other feeling, then I will for sure tell him that as a man, as a straight man, I personally feel that I'm attracted to every single beautiful woman. I have this urge. But just because of this urge, it is, is it justified for me to go after every single beautiful woman that I find attractive? You know the people who are kleptomaniac, they have the urge to steal. So you think it's an urge? I don't believe it's an urge, but it's something that he can control. In the month of fasting, for example, especially in the UK, for 21 hours you're not eating. And in the beginning you have struggles. You're struggling, but at the end of the month you find it very normal. I'm sorry to cut you, but you're comparing um something like homosexuality to stealing and I'm not to, equating and, uh, it. I'm not equating it. No, 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 you're equating. comparing. You're comparing, comparing, comparing but it's, them to, it's to just stealing it's, and to, and to, I'm, I'm and talking about the, to eat. I'm, I'm talking about the physical things. So what would you do then if, you're, uh, if your son came home and told you that I've not been able to tell you this before, but I believe that I'm actually gay? How would you react to that? Either if he's confused, he should try, and he should see that if he can find peace and comfort or love in a woman. If he can't, then I will tell him that the only option that he has is to live a celibate life if he can. Scripture is one thing, but real life is another. And I think if you're living in the real world, you have to question some of the things that you're not only taught, but some of the things that have been left behind for you to learn from. But Muhammad's views are in line with all major Islamic organizations in Britain. And on these streets, some interpret those views in extreme ways. This is Whitechapel in East London. Uh, we're making a programme for the BBC on uh, attitudes towards homosexuality. Do you want you happy to chat about that on no, camera? No, no, no. Why not? No, not on camera, man. Why is that? No, no. You sure? Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's a major sin in part, as far as Islam is concerned, but it doesn't take you out of the fold of Islam. Mm. So technically speaking, yes, you can be gay and be Muslim. What everyone does in their private homes is up to them. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to judge. Can you be gay and Muslim? I don't think so. Because if you're following a religion, you need to follow everything in that religion. If you are a Muslim, you cannot be gay. 
if you are gay, you cannot be Muslim. That's as simple as that. Yeah. Being a Muslim, you can't be a gay or a lesbian. If you can't follow a very tiny rule, then you are not in in the religion. Have you got a couple minutes to chat to me on camera? No? Hello, mate, you got a couple minutes? I've heard some signs of tolerance on the street. Excuse me, sir, have you got two minutes to just chat to me on camera? No? But the Imam's line does seem to hold true for some Muslims, as the rest of Britain moves towards a greater acceptance of homosexuality. In 2007, less than half of the UK population backed gay marriage. Now, 60% are in favour. But support remains lowest among Asian and black men. And I don't think the reasons are just religious. It's really funny thinking about the relationship between uh, music and culture because they sort of they sort of blur definitely in my experience anyway uh, and when it comes to the idea of misogyny and homophobia particularly in black music i i don't know i sort of get quite i don't know i get a little a little funny talking about it because whether i like it or not the music that i love definitely in uh, in, in bits of my past has has reflected a view that that makes me uncomfortable if i'm totally honest Growing up around these attitudes and these hit songs, it's not hard to see why so few black men come out in public. But Max, who I met at the barbers, has promised to show me where some young gay people do feel free to be themselves. Spartan Max. Hey. <laughs> Can we talk about the hat? Yeah, sure. What's the deal with the hat? What happens when the mask comes on? Well, that remains to be seen. You know. Wow, okay. <laughs> I mean, what can you tell me about uh, a night like tonight? You've invited me down. What, what is this? Where are we? Well, we are at Urban World Pride. Events like this are special and important for young gay and lesbian people that are coming out, simply because when they're at home, they may not necessarily feel comfortable letting their family or their friends know that they are gay, which effectively means that they have to hide who they really are. But when they come here, they can first find a summer good family that will accept you for who you are, because we're all the same, you know? Enough talking. Time to see things for myself. It's unbelievable to witness this parallel world. There's guys daggering, guys in there. If you know what daggering is, I mean, you can put that together yourselves, even if you don't know what it is. There are guys daggering, guys in there. That doesn't happen. Well, clearly it does. It didn't happen in my world until today. Now, I mean, there's a Desi room up there. There is a room full of Asian men who I can't even get close to right now with the camera because they just don't want to be seen. And the reason that they don't want to be on camera is fairly obvious. There is so much paranoia, I mean, We've had to come here because literally whenever we pull the camera out, people are running in different directions. I couldn't deny it, do you get what I mean? So I'm not going to let things like 
step on Chichi Man or any of those kind of lyrics really bother me. I'm there to dance. I don't care what they're talking about. Yeah. I know that certain people do have a problem with it, but I find it's more the white community that has problems with the words of the bashment rather than... Yeah. The it's not just bashment, don't get me wrong. Yeah. Hip-hop can be homophobic, Hip -hop yeah. dance hall can be homophobic, but like you said, it's a culture that we've grown up in. Yeah, I've grown up in that music. Does that make it okay? It doesn't make it okay, but there's a lot of things in the world that aren't necessarily okay, but... So you'll overlook it, you're saying? I'll overlook it. Right, what do you think the reaction will be then if you play an elephant man log on in a club it like this? They would all start logging on. They do the dance. Yeah. And would they ignore the step on Chichi Man bit or would they actually yeah, do that? It's like sticks and stones will break your bones, like that kind of situation. It feels like Mark is trying to reclaim these songs. I'm struggling to find other gay men who will speak with me on camera. But Nicole. 21-year-old lesbian with a Jamaican dad agrees. Thank you for uh, finding the time to chat to me. I That's appreciate all right. it. Thank, Thank you, you so much. No, 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 no. It's all good. Thanks. So, do you think it's easier to be uh, a gay girl or a gay guy in London? I say it's hard to be a black gay man. I mean, according to my dad, it's immoral, it's wrong. Um, he sees it as if everybody in our generation is going to accept people being gay, then our generation, when we have kids, they're going to come back to us and tell you that we're sleeping with donkeys and we must accept it. In Jamaica, they see homosexuality as the white man's disease. The way I've been brought up, it's still has an effect on my mind at times. I mean, much as I'm gay, I don't like the person here about two gay guys in their sex life. Like, for me, it just, it just it doesn't, doesn't feel right. But then I feel bad because I'm gay myself. So how can I be prejudiced with somebody else that's gay? Can you understand how, for someone like myself, that sounds absolutely mental? Because yeah. I'm sure the last thing that you want is for anyone to judge you or be prejudiced towards of you. Of course, exactly. But it almost seems as though it's ingrained within you towards towards gay guys. It feels like that. And because I notice it, I feel so bad for it, but I can't help the way I think. I can help the way I act on it, but I can't help the way I think. Nicole is trying to deal with her own homophobia, and she won't let it stop her coming to nights like this. They're just too important. When I first came out, I didn't know that there were so many black gay people in London. I thought the majority of them were in Soho, the majority of them were in the white community. But I came out and I came to a night like this and the whole club was full of pure black people and the majority of them were all gay. I was amazed. There is a bubble around that venue that people are walking into and it's safe. It's weird, like it's a bittersweet sort of thing. You come out of a night like tonight feeling really positive that there is somewhere for young black men to go. But at the same time, you think, wow, there are a lot of people in 2016 who are still scared to be seen being who they truly are on camera. But one person who isn't afraid to be out is Tallulah. And she's keen for me to meet her dad. But first, hair. I think that one there. This one. This one. Yeah, that one. Oh, God. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> See? Look at me. <laughs> That's not too bad, actually, is it? Spice up your life. Yeah, a bit to hold you back up. <laughs> but. It would definitely show all of my Adam's apple. Like, sometimes with my wigs, I get them really big and long so that I can kind of, like, disguise it from the side. Do you know what I mean? When you are shopping in here and you do see other black women, I mean, how do they react to you? I, they just stare a lot. They just look a lot. And, um, and then they'll just whisper amongst themselves. Be like, oh, my God, that's a man. They'll be like, oh, my God, really? Ha no, it's not. And then they'll be like, yeah, look, look at her throat. Mm. And then they'll be like, listen, listen, listen. And then that, that's the kind of whispering it is. Mm. How far away from being who you want to be do you think you really are? Um, I'm a long way, because I've only just started my transition. So it's like four years on the waiting list, unless I can get 12 and a half grand together to have my vaginal plastic and five grand to have my boobs and two and a half grand to get this done, then I'm a very long way. Tallulah is confident no one will be able to tell she once was a man when all the surgery is done including a vaginoplasty. It looks so good, how they do it. Like, it literally looks like a normal vagina. And um, 
Yeah, but the recovery is really long. It's about six months in recovery. You have to sleep with a dildo inside you for six months as well. Yeah, to stop it from healing. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> Surely there's another way of doing that. No, there's no other way. Otherwise, it's just going to heal back together, isn't it? Because it's man-made. It's like a scar or a cut or a wound. A long time. But, um... Yeah, Some people will probably be into that. Yeah, at least it'll be quite <laughs> deep. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not built, I'm not mature enough to have this conversation. Yeah. <laughs> Tallulah's dad, Simon, has flitted in and out of her life. He lives in nearby Derby with his new partner. <laughs> How are you? You all right? How are you How you doing? You good? Reg, yeah, nice Hello. to meet you. Hello, nice you OK? You. Simon, right? Yes. How are you? Yeah. How are you doing? You all right? Yeah, hello. You OK? Depends. How are you? Hello, Reggie, nice to meet you. Hi. How are you doing? What's your name? Uh, Simon, Tilly was just telling me that you haven't seen each other in a long time. Long, long, yeah. <laughs> you something good, didn't you? <laughs> yeah. Do you want to come through? Uh, yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. Simon has spent the last four years behind bars. So, did you find out when you were actually inside? <laughs> I'm sitting there reading in the newspaper, and um, a guy was commenting, he's like, flipping out, goes, look at these, look, it looks real, who doesn't look real in that, yeah? So we're just looking, <laughs> and every single person was like, "No, nah, she's a real, she's a real woman." That no, he may, mm, he's got a bit of a chin and whatever. You know what I mean? <laughs> so um, I looked, and I just went, <laughs> you know, that's, you know, that's my kid." He's like, "Yeah, Brandy." I'm like, "That's my kid." I thought to myself, "I wonder if it's my fault for not being there." See, you. everyone sees it as a fault, don't they? No, no, no. Everyone I'm thinks about, it's, I'm, a, it's a behalf, parenting like, I was, gone I was wrong. looking at it in a way where I think to myself, I wonder if that's because I wasn't around much. So she's, she's grown up around her mum, um, it's April. Yeah. Uh, she's, she's grown up around a lot of women. Mm. And I'm just thinking to myself, maybe if I was there more, would she have wanted to be more of a masculine person? And do you still think that way now? No, not at all. I'm really surprised at your reaction. What it is is my parents are like old-fashioned Jamaican. Christian background, Christian beliefs. So that's the beliefs that I was brought up with. But because I grew up in like areas which is predominantly white, like I was in boarding school and there's only two black people ever been to that school ever. So you know how it feels to be different. So yeah, so to be segregated and to be treated different from other people, mm. I understand that as well. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it all rolls into one. That, that sort of helped me understand why she's the way she is. At the end of the day, what it boils down to is how a person feels comfortable. Yeah. And the other thing is, I mean, she, she's my blood, so... Were you surprised at your dad's reaction? I was, because I've been Honestly, judged so much by the black community as it was, I thought, well, my dad's just going to be another one. Simon, thank you so much for having me. Not a problem. It's been a real pleasure meeting you, yeah. and um, thank you for having me in your home. <laughs> and look, best of luck thank with you. everything. Um, yeah. Hopefully get to see you again soon. Yeah, definitely. Come to Pride on, on the 12th which is in Derby. There's a Derby Pride. Yeah. It's a date. I will see you then. Yeah, definitely. Lovely to see you. Thanks again, yeah. all right? Bye. Take care, guys. Tallulah's dad really surprised me today, given his history and their distant relationship. There is nothing stereotypical about Simon's views. I never thought he would be so accepting. And so, I can't help but think about Sahil, who I met at the start of my journey. He too is still coming to terms with his sexuality, but he's doing it alone, without his mum or dad. So I'm inviting him to join me at Pride next week. Let's hope there are no Muslim anti-gay protesters there, as it wouldn't be the first time. Just doing a teeny bit of research, there hasn't actually been a march as part of Derby Pride in quite a few years because the last time a march happened uh, in 2012, people were arrested. There were uh, people protesting, there was hate speech. Some actually held placards which um, had things written on them such as homosexuality equals freedom gone too far, homosexuality equals a crime against God, and uh, Islam is the ultimate truth. Um, Things such as scum were screamed, uh, gays will go to hell, which just sounds ridiculous to me. I mean, here we go, look, gays, 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 we hope you die of AIDS. To think that grown men were actually chanting this and thought that it was acceptable to me is mind-blowing. This is happening in the UK, not 30 years ago, three years ago. 
one of the Muslim protesters was successfully prosecuted for using abusive language. I'm on my way to Derby to attend my first ever gay pride with Tallulah, and I really hope that Sahil shows up. No, I desperately want Sahil to come today because I think him being one of many, being part of the majority, uh, and not feeling different would be an incredible thing for somebody like him who's only been out a year. But he's just not taking my calls. I suddenly feel like a really annoying, angry girlfriend chasing someone down. <laughs> So the chances are he's changed his mind about coming. How's that for timing? How are you? Hello, are you okay? Are you? you look great. <laughs> Thank you. Right. But I thought I'd make a bit of an effort. Yeah. With it being my hometown pride. Exactly. This will actually be my, uh, my first ever pride, and I'm sort of looking around because I was expecting to see a little bit of, more yeah. sort of celebration. We're well, not in town just yet. Right. But when we get into town, you'll probably see it all more. Yeah. We might have to walk down here first to get down there. It is today, isn't it? <laughs> it's definitely today, right? Oh, well, it should be. It's, it's this way. So. This, this is, this is it. We're here, right? Yeah, this is it. This is the it's not massive, tiny is it? community <laughs> yeah. in, in Derby. Right. This isn't what I was expecting at all. Um, one thing I was expecting was to be here with Sahil and to um, to see this through his fresh eyes as well. Um, but he's not here. He still isn't responding, and um, I'm starting to really believe he's not going to turn up today, which is a shame. But at the same time, I mean, just sort of looking around, in a weird way, I can understand why he might not necessarily feel that he fits in, even here. Because, I mean, it's a very white pride, isn't it? <laughs> and outside of myself in Tallulah, there's one other person of colour here. So, definitely, uh, Tallulah is a minority, within a minority, within a minority today. In Derby, almost one in five people are black or Asian. So if one in 10 people are gay, by rights, in Derby alone, there should be 5,000 homosexual men and women of color. It seems like there's a lot of people stopping to watch. Yeah, they're here. What do you think they're thinking? They're probably thinking, wow, what colorful people. <laughs> Although I spot many black and Asian faces in the crowds of shoppers, they're just here to watch, not take part until I spy just one other person of colour actually marching. Excuse me, sorry to interrupt. One of the most interesting things I've found about today is how few Afro-Caribbean or ethnic minority people there are at Pride. Why do you think there's such a small number? Because it's literally, what, four people? Three people? <laughs> I counted. Yeah. I counted you. But, oh, there's another one, a fresh one. So what would the uh, the, the West, your West Indian, the, uh, the black side well, of your yeah, family, right? yeah. you What would that attitude be towards your sexuality? Well, to be honest, I am, I'm not with that part of the family, but from experience of what I've seen, I think it would be total rejection, yeah. totally. Uh, meanwhile, from the, uh, the white side of your They're family. a bit more tolerant, a lot more, in fact. Why is that? I think white people are. They think they're not, but they are. Derby Pride is now in full swing. Come on, let me hear you scream! And I get talking to the Asian man I spotted earlier. Hello. Hey, how you doing? All right, thank you. I'm Reg, what's your name? I'm Wahid. Wahid, nice to meet yeah. you. OK, not to pry, but uh, I take it you are a, a gay man yourself. Are you a Muslim gay man? Bisexual. Bisexual. Why do you think that you're the only Asian man here today? People are scared about me. I mean, even I'm here because I don't care anymore. I'm over 60. I had my life. I don't care what Maybe this is why Sahil and other black and Asian people have stayed away. Too much to lose, too much to fear. Whilst Derby Pride might not have been as big as I expected, 
there's also been no opposition. So it's almost time to leave Tallulah and prepare to head home. But not just yet. It's a hill. I thought you weren't coming. Well, I'm here now. Come here. <laughs> Good to see you. Yeah, good to now, see you too. this is the first time I've ever been to a Pride event. Yeah. Have you ever been to one before? I've never been to one before. This is my first time as well. Right. Yeah. What do you think? It's amazing. It's absolutely like the the kind of like atmosphere. Like, yeah. have you ever been around this many people who are out before? Never. Like, even most of my friends, like my friend circle, most of them, uh, they're straight. Just how comfortable do you feel in an environment like this? I feel, hmm, it's, I do feel very much out of place, to be honest with you. Why? Because, like, I don't want people to, and I know people will be looking at me and be like, wait, is this guy here to blow us up or what? No. Do you really uh, think people No, 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 I, I mean, I mean, to be fair, I mean, how often do you see, like, a guy with a beard who looks like a proper Muslim, who is a Muslim, um, in, like, an LGBT pride event? Like, now I'm here with you, with you guys. Um, and that's, that's, that's like, that's fine. Um, but alone, I, I wouldn't stay here very long. Yeah, all right, come on. Sahil is convinced everyone sees him as a Muslim first and a gay man second. But is that really true? So I've just stepped away, thinking the hill's gonna follow me out. But he stayed in there, and it looks like the hill is having a tight fucking life. And I think he might have made some friends. Stop the hill. One second, I'm just gonna think it's this one second. Come here, you. Like you're having a time of your life. I, I am. I wasn't expecting this. So you look like you made two new friends. Yeah, I did. I I, uh, I wasn't like kind of expecting to stay here very much like after like. But well, hang yeah. on a second. What well, you're gonna stay? Yeah, I wasn't. I wasn't planning on, but now I am. Yeah, yeah. So you're gonna hang back and you're gonna yeah. have a night out in Derby. Yeah. Pretty much, yeah. You. Yeah. <laughs> Based on what you told me in the past about how you feel and how you reacted to gay people, being in an environment like this. <laughs> Now feeling the way you do about yourself, how are you reacting to men holding hands and men kissing? Um, I've had this residual homophobia in me for a long time, um, but now today here, I'm not sure if I still have it, but it kind of hasn't reared its head. Listen, enjoy your night, have fun, yeah, and uh, get back in one piece, all right? I will. <laughs> Come on, get I'll in try, there. I'll try. Get I'll in try. there. Get in there. Go on. Take care. Deal out. He's this close to running back. <laughs> to experience my first ever Pride with Sahil was awesome because it was his first time uh, at a day like this and his journey has taken a massive, massive leap in a, in a positive direction I think today. He really is embracing who he truly is and he is not suppressing it anymore and that can't be anything but positive. Now on the other hand, the, the negative side to today, I think, was that an event like this didn't really have many people that looked like me there. Um, to be exact, I think it was maybe four. It says a lot about how comfortable people like me feel to be who they truly are publicly. Being a British guy in 2015 is not easy. 21st century pressures are changing. No way. The way we live. Women are seen as superior to men. The way we love. If you are a Muslim, you cannot be gay. It's as simple as that. Even the way we look. That silicone. Yeah. This is mental. In this series, I'm traveling to the extreme edge of modern British masculinity. They basically said the only way you can stay is if you agree to be exercised, to get the, the demons out of you. 
50 years after women began a march for equal rights, the battle of the sexes is being fought on a new front. The state of gender relations is at its worst probably for 100 years. But this time, it's not by women. Men rape, men rape. That's all we hear about, that men are rapists. It's by young men. Men are murdered more, commit suicide more, men are homeless more, men are raped more in prison than women are total. I want to know why so many young guys feel overlooked. Women are no longer trained to submit to a man, to serve a man. Overly judged. I think the UK, especially the media, needs to decide whether or not they want freedom of speech or they want to stop people being offended by comedy. And under attack. I thought this would be like a concerted attempt to shut men up. I want to find out why a new generation of men thinks the real victims of sex discrimination are guys. I'm pretty confident that women's issues are being dealt with. Men's issues, not so much. It's Sunday morning, the perfect time for a lecture by a man who teaches guys how to get more sex. Meet American blogger, Roosh V. So what I wanted to talk about today is having sex with girls you don't really like. I probably am not gonna spend more than a couple hours just to access their warm, moist cavity holes. Roosh made his name as a so-called pickup artist, writing guides for young men on how to sleep with women around the world. He's got a book called 30 Bangs. <laughs> what? Bang Ukraine, bang Iceland, bang Poland, bang Lithuania. Don't bang Denmark. <laughs> Apparently Denmark isn't worth banging. <laughs> but in 2012, a US civil rights group included Roosh on a list of websites they branded hateful and misogynistic. British girls are busted. You know they're not that old, but they just look old, like they've been working in a factory or coal mine their entire lives. But he hasn't let that hold him back. He's now on a world tour. Though from the sounds of it, he's expecting trouble. He's actually kept the venues that he's doing his events at a secret. Uh, up until the very last minute. Um, according to his website, the reason is that he's worried about feminists. Is what he's doing and saying so offensive that people are going to try and shut down this event? The name of the talk is The State of Man. One of the first bullet points uh, in terms of what his speech will contain is something about the paradox of modern women. It, it feels like it's a lot broader than here's how to chat up the lady that you fancy at the bar. On the outside, it doesn't look like anyone's about to storm the doors. But inside, I'm starting to notice a real atmosphere. Thanks. I'm not sure anyone wants me here. We've already agreed not to show the faces of anyone who wants to remain anonymous. I'm pretty sure that this is the first time I've filmed anywhere where everyone insists on it. Roosh's topic today is the state of man. Maybe it's more controversial than I expected. Sorry to jump in front of the queue. I just want to say thank you for having us here, man. A lot of people have turned up today to hear you speak. The reason I came here is because the percentage of English men who read me is very large. And to, that is a weird thing, because I'm not from, from here. But the problem is, men are not allowed to speak the views that I am, am speaking. It takes an outsider to come here and not be afraid of the hate crime laws that you guys have to give the truth. And so I wish there were more men here who could share their views, but if they do, we all know that people are gonna go after their jobs and shame them. You've got all shapes and sizes in here. It is really a broad spectrum as well in terms of race and, and background. And it actually feels quite excitable in here. You know, there's a room full of men who are excited about what they're about to hear. So am I. Something has happened in the past 50 years where women are no longer trained to submit to a man, to serve a man. The very idea of beauty and aesthetics is being demolished to where now women 
are being applauded and encouraged to look like fat, outer space cyborgs. Women and gays are seen as superior to straight men. Anything that a woman or a gay person wants is theirs. But anything you want, sorry, we cannot help you. All of you here are seen as rapists. You have to be taught how not to rape by a feminist who is really fat. Now, these aren't really the dating tips I was expecting. This is beginning to sound more like a conspiracy theory. The bad news is that we haven't hit the bottom. Do you think that eventually this will become a political movement? And if the answer is yes, I'd like to put in my application to work for you. <laughs> That's not a joke. I have a, a daughter, and sometimes I do fear for her upbringing. I think I'm doing a fairly good job. I try and set, you know, a good moral guideline for her to follow. But what am I going to do to stop her from becoming the worst of what we see in society today? You should give her a man to marry at a young age, 18. At least when she's 30, you have three or four grandkids. Or she's gonna be what? She's gonna work in a job, one bad boy after the next. Many of you actually are going to use her. <laughs> I don't think you should give her the freedom and the choice. Let's see what, what did Reggie think about what we discussed today? It's been a much broader talk than I expected, in all honesty. I sort of came here expecting to hear uh, how to pick up women but it seems to be uh, more about masculinity more than anything else. Now, I take it that you have achieved a level of fame here. How have you leveraged that fame to sleep with the women that you want? Like, I, I really want to know that. Like, is it easy? Like, do girls just come up to you? I've been doing what I do for a long time, and I started in television when I was eight years old, so this isn't new to me anymore. Are you gay? <laughs> no. I'm actually, in, no, I'm actually engaged to be married, so no. Oh, okay. Yeah. Out of interest, just how big do you think what it is that you're doing here will actually get? The sites that I run touch over one million people every month. And maybe they're not willing to come here and pay, but the ideas that I share is growing and growing. All right, follow me out, lads, please. And then, just when I think no one will go on camera, two men agree to meet me outside. Adam runs his own business, and Lorenzo is studying to be a barrister. So what is it that's actually brought you guys here today? Why have you decided to come down? Well, what's brought me here really is, um, I thought that's sort of a concerted attempt to shut men up recently, right. the past few years, and we're sort of losing ground. The BBC doesn't have a great, you know, it doesn't get a great flat when it, when it comes to these, these sort of things at all. They mm. do seem to be on the side of what's, you know, what's, what's right on. Yeah. And feminism is the fashionable cause. And what sort of man is attracted to an event like today, do you think? Somebody who wants to engage with a very international, as you can see, a uh, group of concerned fellow travellers who are interested in discussing these, these, these problems. I mean, look, at, look, at, look in here. These people are now mixing together, and very few of them have met one another before. Yeah. The funny thing is, Whilst these guys want to meet women, and that's what Rouge sells, some of them don't seem to like them very much. And there are some really offensive, strong views from what, on face value, seems to be the meekest of the meek, the most normal looking guys. And they have these views that are just unbelievable. The thing that worries me most is that a lot of the ideas that are coming out of that room might be more commonplace than I probably assumed this morning. Nevertheless, many of the men I met at the seminar claim they had to hide their views and their faces for fear of repercussions at work. There is one guy whose view on this I'd really like to hear. Comedian Daniel O'Reilly built an online audience in the millions with short vines showing proper geezer dapper laughs out on the pool. What's your name? Holly. 
Carly, fucking she knows. Carly, Carly, you're lovely. Shh, oh yeah, you're lovely. I've always had a thing for lovely women. Do you want to see it? Hey, hey! <laughs> and landed himself a mainstream TV series off the back of his success. Girls, all the girls down the front are always the same. They start off at the beginning. Dada! Dada! Halfway through the show. Dada! Dada! After the show. Ah but Dapper's laddishness was branded sexist and even misogynistic from the start. And when it was alleged he'd made a joke about rape at a gig, Daniel found himself on Newsnight, defending his entire act. Just show her your penis. If she cries, she's playing hard to get. What you're saying is that women who say no don't mean no. With no disrespect to you, do you think, looking at me now, that I actually would go out and do that? Although Daniel apologised, his TV show was cancelled, but his character Dapper Laughs lives on. The only reason I wear a condom, right, is to stop the girl getting pregnant, but I've got a couple of other tips for you. Get yourself one of them morning after pills, yeah? Crush it up, put it in her drink. <laughs> I'm joking, respect women, respect women. From the sounds of it, Daniel hasn't made any changes, and he's pretty unrepentant despite all the flack. Uh, who, who saw me on Newsnight? Who saw that? <laughs> That, that interview was hard for me because it's the only time I've actually really played a character. <laughs> <laughs> on the outside, I'm going, no, of course, of course that's not acceptable to go up to a woman and say, get your gash out. On the inside, I'm going, <laughs> 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 can you get your fucking gash out? <laughs> hey, hey! Enjoy the rest of your night. Thank you very much for coming, bye bye. <laughs> get this fucking beer. How do you think that went? The show was great. Yeah? yeah? And it seems as though your crowd is very much sort of predominantly young men, 25 and under. Yeah, but I mean... Why do you think that, that that's the crowd? That you saw a lot of women there, though. Yeah, well, exactly. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'll, I'll get to the girls, but, I mean, the, the, the mainstay of your crowd is young men. Why, why do you think that is? Uh, I think just because I started... When I started off doing the comedy, I was, well, I was really trying to take the piss out of men's attitudes, like, yeah. oi, oi, fucking, she knows, like, and a lot of people don't want to go and laugh at political satire or current affairs. Yeah. Sometimes they just want to laugh at something that's easy to laugh at. Why do you think women come to your show? Unless you've got, an, unless you've got um, a cause to fight, like you're a feminist or uh, you're against sexism or... Unless you've got a cause to fight, a lot of the young girls are like, they can see I'm taking the piss out of men. Do you think that it's... The reason that what happened to you happened was because you made a joke about something as serious as rape, or do you think it happened because of um, your particular brand of humour? I think it happened because I blew out, I blew up outside of the conventional way of becoming. It wasn't that one incident. It was just the speed that you got to where you. I, I was getting shit from the. Oh, sorry. I was getting. I was getting stuff from them. Same journalists from them. Same people. Months before that, they were just looking for something. My family personally has been affected by sexual violence. It's not a joke, do you know what I mean? And the only reason why I quit at the time is because what the, what the, the, the media were putting on the family. It was, it was horrible. I always judge how well I'm doing in life by what my mum says. And my mum has not been offended by anything that I fucking put out there. Because she knows I'm taking the piss out of men. But listen, do you know what they're doing in the media now? They won't go, oh, I didn't find it funny, but I respect his audience and that he's allowed to do that brand of comedy. They will say, it's shit. I think the UK, especially the media, needs to decide whether or not they want freedom of speech or they want to stop people being offended by comedy. I think comedy is the last, the last avenue we've got. It's comedy that, like, do you know, what's next? You're going to stop, you're going to ban people watching horror movies because someone's going to go out and kill someone. If I say something on stage and someone goes out and does it, they're screwed in the head. That's got nothing to do with me. Do you ever worry about the way that it could be taken out of context or the way that it could offend? Yeah, pff, I, I, it depends who's in the audience. I ain't going to be taken out of context with my fans because my fans are watching and go, <laughs> I had the same stuff on the building site yesterday. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> that all got uh, a bit emotional and, um, and I can understand why. You know, this is a man who feels as though he lost his, um, his moment, his opportunity, but unfortunately, whether he wants to admit it to himself at the moment or not, he is normalising a certain level of humour that a lot of people find offensive. 
real equality feminists today have a real problem with the mainstream feminists because the mainstream feminists are radical Marxist feminists. Feminism. Speaker's Corner in London has always been a place for people to meet and share controversial views. And today is no exception. Men rape, men rape. That's all we hear about, that men are rapists and child abusers. This is what feminism has been talking about. Now, she, have you noticed what she did then? What she did is she simplifies things down to say that I'm a, I'm a woman hater. Rod is a men's rights activist and is determined no one's going to shut him up. Men don't need our our help. Women, they do need our help. They need our help very much. Our problem. Well done. That got a bit intense, didn't it? It does, but you get heckled to pieces. Do you think coming here to Speaker's Corner week on week is going to actually change anything? Yes, because what happens, we often see a young man standing in the background, doesn't say anything, stays for hours. Hello everybody, uh, my name's Josh, I'm 18, I'm from Essex. In my spare time I do a YouTube channel and a blog about gender politics and men's issues. There's another crowd gathered around a second speaker, but there's something different here. What is the obstacle to getting men's issues addressed in society? He's just a teenager. People don't know what men's issues are. Domestic violence against men is not treated seriously. When numerous places have done tests where they got women to hit men in public. People have laughed and taken videos and said, oh, he probably deserves it. And the opposite never happens. Thanks for listening. Just out of interest, um, what put this on your radar? Why uh, would you say the, uh, the issues that, uh, that men are dealing with uh, is, such a, is such a problem for you? Men's issues, I feel like there are far too, particularly young voices, there are far too few. I mean, we've got uh, the Minister for Women and Equalities here in the UK, we've got the European Parliament Committee on Women's Rights, and we've got UN Women. We have no comparative organisations for men. So I'm pretty confident that women's issues are being dealt with. Men's issues, not so much. I hadn't expected young guys like this to be so angry about what they see as discrimination against men. Meanwhile, Roosh's world tour has rumbled onto Canada, but he's run into some local opposition. The Toronto media, Toronto Star, City News, every channel, I'm the leading newscast. Me, a random writer from the US who wants to meet with 40 guys just to have fun with them and talk to them. But it's not just Roosh. With a few clicks, I'm starting to realize these kinds of views are easy to find. Now this idea of what Roosh is about and what he stands for seems to be a small part of a much bigger conversation because on Roosh's website there is mention of this thing that I've never heard of before and it's called the Manosphere. No, it's a real thing. The Manosphere is a name given to an informal network of blogs, websites and internet commentators that focuses on issues relating to men and masculinity, often in opposition to feminism. Now, growing up with four sisters, you want to see them blossom and you don't see anything that can help that as being negative. But being at Roosh's seminar, the word feminism seemed to come up over and over again and it was never presented in a positive light. But Roosh isn't the only one. British journalist Milo Yiannopoulos has written for The Telegraph, news sites and has his face all over YouTube. He seems to have done an incredible job of continuously arguing with journalists and politicians and feminists, he feels like someone that I need to have a, a chat with. And it turns out, with a growing profile as a self-proclaimed anti-feminist, Milo is only too happy to meet with me. Good to meet you too, good to meet you too. Uh, how are you? Yeah, good, thanks. Uh, listen, you are the perfect person uh, for me to speak to uh, at this point. I met Rushfi very recently okay cool. and um, yeah. I've sort of been made hip to this whole idea of the manosphere can you sort of explain to me what the manosphere is and what it's broken up into yeah I mean it's a very eccentric sort of group of men who feel dissatisfied with the way that society is going the right. way that the relationships relationships between men and women are organized and I think a lot of men are feeling as though their traditional role as provider has been you know um, diluted to such a point where they're not really sure what they're supposed to be there for anymore. And what a lot of the pickup artists, people like Roosh, do for these guys is give them a renewed sense of purpose. Um, a lot of these young boys are very worried that they will 
be alone forever. A lot of them are worried they won't ever get do good jobs and they will never get a decent pension. And, um, and they sort of just don't know where they fit. It kind of feels like it's two sides going against each other. You've got the manosphere uh, and all the permutations of that, and then you've got uh, feminism. Yes. What's your, your take on that? Um, what's happened to feminism in the last sort of 20 years is it's become very tied up with very far left activist politics. And this particular brand of feminism, which says that women shouldn't just be equal to men, but should be the same as men, you know, if they want to sort of grow their hair and get fat, then they should be allowed to, ignores basic biological realities. And it also ignores some of the things that are different about men and women and different ways that men and women see, look for happiness. I think um, that the state of gender relations the um, understanding and happiness between the two uh, sexes is at its worst probably for 100 years. Um, and I think that it, it, you could reasonably say that feminism has a large part to play in that. Now, obviously... now I find these views surprising. And I'm not a feminist, but you don't have to be one to be challenged by Milo's point of view. I've had messages about you prior to us meeting. Already? So, yeah, of course. And what are they saying? And they say, this guy's going to stitch us up. I can tell. I can tell he's going to stitch us up. And I can't blame them for this because it has happened to them so many times before. Over and over and over again, they're just outright lied about. Right. He's made it really clear that people are worried about me. <laughs> I don't know why they're worried about me. What have I done? Um, it's, it's mental that, you know, I'm so early on in, in, this, in this, this journey and already, um, people are paranoid that I'm out to get them. There seems to be this weird sort of sense of paranoia in this world. It's frustrating to be judged before I've even begun. I want to see if I can persuade anyone from these secretive online groups to meet me face to face. They have started discussing me and what it is I'm trying to achieve online. Uh, now, when I say discussing, what I mean is putting up video blogs on YouTube. And it's not just the one video, they're shitloads. <laughs> Some of these anti-BBC videos have had thousands of views already. So maybe YouTube is the best way to try and set up a talk. This could be the worst idea ever, but I think it's worth having a crack at. Hello there, Mittal. Uh, my name is Reggie Yates. Uh, some of you know that, most of you probably don't. I'm in your world now. All that I want to do is make a program that features you and your beliefs, where they come from and who exactly you are. So uh, get in touch, thank you. I do think there is a small chance that we may have a conversation, but I think it will be on their terms. And if that means it's a Google chat, if that means that it's via the comment section, so be it. It's 2015, damn it. But whilst I wait for replies to my video, I'm still intrigued by that young guy standing on a soapbox in Hyde Park. Welcome to Feminist Idiocy. In contrast to feminist hypocrisy, this series is simply me explaining issues that feminists talk about that are ridiculous. Josh told the crowd to check out his videos on YouTube. So I have, and the content is far more extreme than anything he said in the park. So the best way to discuss rape and the chances of it happening is to take the emotional element out of the question. Of course, that's why feminists are shitty at discussing rape. That was it. What on earth is it that is inspiring someone so young to say so much? Uh, and why does he feel as strongly as he does at such a young age? At 18, I wasn't thinking like this. We are now approaching Colchester. Josh has agreed to meet me at his home. I want to find out what's behind his views. Hi. Hello. Hello. How are you doing, Josh? I'm good, you? I am good also. Thank you for having me in your home. Oh, it's okay. Why well, have you got a Anfield Road sign up? Am I in a Liverpool Football Club? Dad's, a, Dad's a big Liverpool fan. Oh, football. get me out of here. <laughs> so you live with your parents? Yeah, mum and dad. Okay. All right. It's the room. There we go. Right. Okay, what are you working on over here then? Uh, so this you've is got the script. A massive for... sort of document. Oh, so you write scripts for your yeah, videos? Yeah, yeah, I do script them. I used to not, but then I just ramble and go off on a tangent and have to edit loads of stuff out. So mm -hmm. that's a script for uh, part one of my drunk sex series. Josh is recording today, the latest in a series on how men can be unfairly accused of rape. 
all right, I need to see the studio. Studio is probably a generous <laughs> term, it's just our spare room. The people who owned this house before us had a very young daughter, so it's decorated for like a two year old girl. Oh, right, okay. So. <laughs> oh, you weren't joking. No, it is. Two you years. really aren't joking. That mum bought that as a joke because it went with the room in a sort of <laughs> funny way. That's not a serious thing. Okay, so this is where you shoot your videos. This is it. Basically, yeah, it's a tiny little set. It's... This is the chair? That is the Can chair. I sit in the chair. You're welcome to sit in the Look chair. At this. Do you not think it's crazy that, you know, you're literally sat here in your spare room with a camcorder and a bit of a script and suddenly yeah. people all over the world have access to your points of view? Is yeah, that... it's insane. It's insane. I've got, you know, just over 2,000 subscribers watching these videos and, and liking what they see. I want to see you do what you do. OK, yeah, I can do that. Let's do it then. Can I help in any way? Uh, no, at the moment the camera only works when it's plugged in, so right. I'm going to have to do that. Fit loads, come on. So what's the theme of the video then? Um, Measurements of drunk sex. So, what is drunk? I just have interest. Why is this issue on your radar right now? Uh, I read uh, an article in, I think, Huffington Post about uh, California's new yes means yes law. So, the basis of your think piece, if if, if you want to call it that, have come from what exactly? Um, mostly from just sort of thinking about it, really, because it's just something. A lot of the things I talk about are just things you can understand if you just think about them in more detail. Mm. Hello everybody, welcome to Drunk Sex, a treatise in three parts. So, uh, uh, let's try that one again. Hello everybody, welcome to Drunk Sex, a treatise in three parts. This is part one, measurements. So, drunk sex, a lot of feminists are now saying, is rape. Think about the perils just of going on holiday. I could find a girl here in the UK, we could have sex, it's fine, she's not too drunk, she's still legally able to drive. We go to a US state with a stricter rule, and suddenly I'm a rapist. It also has to be something that people can be expected to keep track of. At 18, Josh is not afraid to speak out. I'm just not sure why. This will overwhelmingly be a burden on men. Thank you very much for watching. I've been Josh. Boom. And wow. just like that, it's done. Yeah, just as my uh, SD card ran out of memory. Perfect. <laughs> I had to cut a little bit out for that. Wow. What's really fascinating about you, Josh, is your age. You know, you are so young. And over the years, I've met activists all over the world. Um, fighting for different causes and the thing that is consistent in all of those people that I've met is that there is a reason. What is your reason? I don't really have a satisfying answer to that question. People ask me it all the time and it's it's not like I had some big life-changing experience like a lot of people do. You know a lot of the people I speak to in the men's movement are they, they went through a troubling divorce or they um, were abused by a partner or they were raped. It was never like that for me. As a living I'd like to be you know a men's issues speaker, or I'd like to, to join a think tank that talks about these issues, something like that. This is something I want to do for the rest of my life. We've got some stuff that she was given as a present. And uh, is this mum's, table mum's or yes. yours? That's mum's. Mine's in the sink, actually. You can grab a seat out here. Look at this. Perfect. How do uh, women react to your views? Particularly, well, you, your mum. I mean, you, you live at home. How does she react to some of the things that you say in your videos? Uh, no, nothing I say in my video is, is anti-woman, but some women do treat it as if it's an attack on women. I wouldn't talk about women's issues and feminism at all if I didn't think I needed to for men's issues. So if it wasn't the case that our domestic violence laws were heavily influenced by feminist academia, I wouldn't speak about it. What gets picked on? What is it that they, they jump on? I talk about false rape claims. I say false rape accusations are really harmful to someone's life. People have been killed by mobs without a court case ever taking place. Um, and I try and talk about that and they, they, they accuse me of derailing the conversation because false rape accusations are only 2%, even though we can't get an accurate study on that. It's more you're not focusing on the right issues than you're actively promoting something that's anti-women. False rape claims are disgusting and that's one of my worst nightmares to be accused for a crime, mm. served time for something I definitely didn't do. But the fact that rape exists and the fact that it is such an issue and the fact that it is happening, it's happening on every street and people aren't talking about it. It is a real issue. Yes, but I don't, it's not like I'm hearing someone talk about how bad is rape is and I'm like, oh, also false rape accusations. No, it's a complete separate thing. I'm trying to get to the bottom of why so little of your time is dedicated to being 18. Because you're I, only 18 once. I do once. spend my time being 18, I do. This doesn't take up like half of my time. But I think I have an advantage over the men who, who have had their lives derailed purely because I'm not coming at it from an emotional angle, which means, because, because, if you are emotional about something, it can lead to you being aggressive. Josh is a really impressive speaker, but I can't help worrying that he's building opinions about how women behave 
based on other men's bad experiences that he's found online, before he's even had a chance to live his own life. And there is nothing wrong with fighting for men's rights. There is nothing wrong with believing that there should be equality. But when your own personal experience with women has been hard, has been unfavorable, and that then affects the way that you view the world, to then present that as the gospel is where things get dangerous, especially when you're looking at how many young men this is beginning to affect. But at least Josh is prepared to stand up, be counted and meet me face to face. And other anti-feminists on the internet? Not so much. But my video has caused a reaction and plenty of anonymous men have had their say. <laughs> Only a fool would trust this dude. Fuck off. BBC stands for Big Black Cock. If this is what I'm receiving, after literally sticking my tiny brown pinky toe into the pool that is the manosphere, what is it like for a feminist? What is it like for someone who says, I disagree with you guys? I don't know. Journalist Laurie Penny has written about both men's rights activism and sexism on the net. She's agreed to talk about the kind of response she gets when she does. So exactly what sort of uh, interaction have you had with these, these guys online? Well, um, in terms of threats, I've had everything ranging from individual attacks, people sending me pictures of like gross pornography with my head pasted on, uh, getting fisted by Hitler. Uh, I had a bomb threat sent to my house. Uh, well, people saying they knew where my house was. I had to leave, so did my landlord. People really want to intimidate me and anybody who writes about feminism online. Could you show me some of the messages that you've actually received? Then? Yeah, well, I'm not totally happy with them showing on camera, but you can have a look at them. Yeah, I mean, people just send that sort of oh nonsense God. to me. Well, that's one of the milder ones. Oh, my God, so... Yeah, that was last week. That's... That, is that a picture? That's actually... They found a picture of you and pasted it onto... Yeah, that... Onto that image. Yeah. Why are you specifically being targeted? Well, it's not me specifically. It's every woman who writes about feminism on the internet to some extent. I'm absolutely not the only one. The intention is to silence people and shut them down. Um, I think it's very ironic that these men's rights activists claim that they feel silenced when they are organising to silence women. What is it that's motivating these men to do this? I mean, what is the problem that they have that is manifesting itself in sending these images, do you think? Um, there is a lot of genuine frustration behind the men's act rights activist movement. Um, and I understand the emotions that are behind that sense of powerlessness and a feeling of loss of power. The trouble is that whilst feelings are valid, it's what you do with those feelings that makes the decision about who you are as a human being. <laughs> So what's driving hate like this? And who are these people? In 2013, even a simple campaign to commemorate Jane Austen on a £10 note resulted in a barrage of vile abuse sent to female campaign leaders. Free speech is one thing, but threats of rape, or worse, feels different to me. And they're becoming more and more common online. I just don't get where all this hate is coming from. But I know a man who might. How you doing? How you doing, right? Good to see you. Yeah, very Milo good. Yiannopoulos. I met Laurie, who is a feminist who I know that you're aware of. And uh, Laurie has received unbelievable messages, which go from, I know where you live, to I'm watching you right now, to I'm going to do X, Y, Z to you tonight. They don't it's believe scary. this, do you? It's not scary. Look, okay. Oh, come on. Listen, this is the typical bait and switch that happens with progressive activists, right? You you goad people, you egg them on, you deliberately provoke them, and then suddenly you turn around and play the victim because you've got messages that you don't like the sound of. Well, I'm sorry, but you know, if, you're, if your entire career is based around telling white men that there is something wrong with them, you can't then complain when you get messages on Twitter saying that, you know, that somebody wants to hurt Why you. Why do you think men resort to using the word rape so often? What the study shows is that um, men and women use slightly different language when they lose their temper. Women tend to call each other sluts and bitches and whores and that sort of stuff. Rape as, as a sort of expression of power and domination is more what men go for when they lose their temper, like they might threaten to beat you up. 
What does this mean for men moving forward? Well, it means for men that you can't win an argument in the public sphere unless you watch your language so carefully. When they speak out, they lose their jobs or they get just as much trolling as, the, you know, as, as any feminist activist. But that's the dysfunctional situation we've got ourselves into precisely because men are terrified to speak out about this stuff. Milo seems to be saying women are just being given too much, even too much protection. But with everything I've heard and read online, I'm finding it harder than ever to see men as the victimized sex. So where does that leave someone like Rush V? I go to the supermarket to be a pervert to film that girl's ass and another girl's ass. I've had to fly to Poland to find out. He just wasn't meeting the right kind of girls in America. They cut their hair short. They are so lazy to maintain long hair that they make themselves ugly on purpose. So he moved here a year ago to a small university town full of female students. And before we meet, there's just time for a refresher on his back catalogue. Now, there is a lot of Rouge V books, which are available on huge websites online, by the way. Anyone can buy this stuff. And the sort of thing that is in these books is, um, yeah, it's not the sort of thing that I'd want my younger brother to read. It took four hours of foreplay and at least 30 repetitions of no, Rouge, no, until she allowed my penis to enter her vagina. No means no, until it means yes. That's actually written here. Uh, while walking to my place, I realised how drunk she was. In America, having sex with her would have been rape, since she couldn't legally give her consent. It didn't help matters that I was relatively sober, but I can't say that I cared or even hesitated. It's actually illegal to force someone to have sex in Iceland too, Rouge. I know that when it comes to sex, one ounce of hesitation or feeling of morality will get me nothing. That one actually leaves a nasty taste in your mouth. At his seminar, Rouge told me he has a million visitors a month to his sites. And one of the articles he posted there earlier this year caused horror around the world. There's a piece he's actually written on his website called How to Stop Rape. And um, there's a section here that reads, uh, I thought about this problem and I'm sure I have the solution. Make rape legal if done on private property. I propose that we make the violent taking of a woman not punishable by law when done off of public grounds. Basically you're saying, if you rape someone on private grounds in, in, in a private residence, it should be okay. That is fucking disgusting. <laughs> oh. This isn't about confidence. You know, 30 bangs <laughs> isn't about making young men feel as though they have value. This is about making young women feel as though they have none. Rouge is now back from the Canadian leg of his world tour, where there was a furious reaction to his article on rape. The mayors of Montreal and Toronto tried to ban him, and he was even physically attacked in the street. Now, I'm about to meet this mammoth of the manosphere in his own home. Hey, Reg, how's it going? I'm very good, thank you. I haven't you. seen you in a while. It's, uh, it's a shoes off house, is Yes, it? please, shoes okay. off. No worries. I maintain a clean home. <laughs> That's a big old apartment you got here. Here's the uh, bed. Uh, one of the signs I used in the lecture, <laughs> oh my God. I found a way to use it here. <laughs> Oh, you know, I mean, really? Just, is that, is, I mean, at just, least tell me you put that up for my benefit. Is no, that normally no, this, there? I mean, you know, this sign I hope will stay here. Again, I, I know you already saw this sign in London, but I think there's another use of it that I can use here. And I work here, so all the genius that you may have come across that I've put out starts there. What's in the kitchen? Uh, I, is it pure oh, muscle Williams. building foods? Look at that. No, it's like, you know, healthy food. We got vegetables, eggs, yeah. cheeses, whole foods, yeah. right? But sometimes if a girl comes over, you know, you got to give her the uh, supermarket champagne that I, I bought, on, say, that I say bought on, on sale. You're yeah. really spoiling But they don't know that. They don't know that. Uh, so how long has it been since you got back from, uh, from Canada? All the I'm, world tour? And I've only been back for about five, five days. So yeah. I'm still recovering from the drama there. They took one article I wrote called How to Stop 
rape. It was a satirical thought ex experiment that the way to reduce rape is to encourage women to take responsibility for what they do. And I say we should legalize rape, which of course is an absurd notion. But I've they, actually read that. Yeah, but they I've took read the it. piece. And it, I, I, you use the word satirical, and it's quite hard to find the satirical angle to it when you're actually reading it. The point I'm trying to make is what would happen if we took this absurd notion and took it in a literal sense? Well, women would just take more care of themselves like they take care of their smartphone, their purse, and their car. But what the media did, they said he is a rape advocate. I'm surprised at how indignant Rue seems at how his rape article was taken. My goal as a writer is to make sure that my ideas spread far and, and wide. So of course satire is going to be misinterpreted. But to be misinterpreted by everyone in Canada, all the media and even the politicians who came out against me, seems to be a deliberate action of theirs to paint me as someone that I'm not. Rouge can't seem to see himself as anything but the victim in this, despite so many people's horror at what he wrote. I'm wondering if he will take any responsibility for what he's telling young men about sex. One of the things that really troubled me, particularly from the point of view of someone who has a younger brother, who is in his teens, if he were to read that book, for instance, and read the passage, no means no until it means yes, I'd be really concerned about what that might do in his mind. I can understand, but I don't agree that the writing I share crosses a line. I advocate for consensual sex. That, but we have to understand how sex actually, actually happens. We both know that if you bring a woman into your apartment and she, in a, with a smile, says, no, we're not going to do anything, does that actually mean no? Is that when you stop and ask her to leave? Of course, no means no. And I have to state that. Then you stop, wait until she is ready to go farther, and then you go on. But in your book, you talk about a, a situation where there's a woman who's half asleep and you jammed it in, I believe is the words that you used, which is so horrible. Um, but have, haven't you done that when a girl no. was half asleep? A girl that you already had sex with. You've never done It wasn't the first time I had sex with her. No. Are you sure? <laughs> Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Okay, listen, I mean, I'm sure you've had sex with girls who were on some kind of alcohol or something else. Does that mean that you raped them? Of course not. So if you want to examine every instance, every thrust, maybe you can find something, but this can happen to every man. Uh, Rich, thank you for, for having me in your home. No more articles on how to rape women. No, I think that? I'm done with the I rape issue. I think you should leave that for I think I've made the point, you know? Yeah, and you, you made a point. Okay, man. Take sure. down. Sure. It was an issue when I was growing up, and it seems to be an issue now, and that is that young men need role models. They always have, and they always will. And it just seems as though this movement um, is providing role models just a different kind to the ones that I agree with. I think if you've got a man to look up to that is telling you that you'll be all right and that is showing you how to navigate this weird world, <laughs> then you might just survive. But if you've got someone whose view is massively skewed and massively influenced by their own inadequacies or issues, then you're going to have some of your own. My worry is that there are a ton of young men who are desperately searching for something and are finding it in the manosphere, when in reality, what they actually need is, is they need a confidence boost and they need someone to show them that you don't have to be this way to be successful in any part of your life, particularly when it comes to women. South Africa, a country Devoted to God. Literally, wherever you walk in the city, you can hear a church. There's literally churches everywhere. You can almost pick one tailor-made for you. With more people living with HIV than any other country in the world, and 70% of young people unemployed, this is a place in need of miracles. Luckily, there are dozens of evangelical pastors on hand promising healing. If I bless you today, you are blessed. 
and extravagant riches to all who believe. If you are hearing me, your money is also coming to you. I've got a mixed history with this kind of faith. My mum took me to an African Pentecostal church as a kid. The minute it became my decision, I've chosen not to follow any, any particular religion. I think I'm one of the few West Africans who aren't scared to say that church isn't really for them anymore. I've come here to find out why one of these magical mega churches is your father, he's your God, he's your shepherd is so popular with young South Africans. Do you like what I'm doing or not? And why its preacher touch your breast is as rich and famous as a rock star. I honestly think there is like no man like him. You are special, you are precious, you are black and powerful. But will my lack of faith watching him spend money is actually making my hairs stand on end? See me excommunicated. I don't like arrogance, I don't like pride. We have white people here, but you're whiter than white people. Or could it land me in a whole heap more trouble? In one of these cars, currently surrounded by men with machine guns, there's a man coming to see me, and he's pissed. <laughs> Johannesburg, a city where over three million people call themselves Christians. Worship here is on a mega scale. I've come to spend a week with one of the most controversial mega churches called Incredible Happenings. Going to church is something that I haven't done in a long time. You know what, in, in all honesty, I genuinely don't remember the last time I went to church through choice. Seriously. Yeah. With a following in the tens of thousands, Incredible Happenings is unlike any church I've been to. It's led by a self-proclaimed prophet called Mboro. I release the blood of Jesus, the blood of Christ. Touch the screen and receive your miracle. Despite growing up in a poor slum, God has been good to him. He's now a multi-millionaire owning several houses and 30 flash cars. but he often hits the headlines for all the wrong reasons, like allegedly waving a gun around in a radio station. Bad criticism, bad publicity, I, I want to thank them for that because they made me famous. I'm really excited about me and Mboro. I'm desperate to know why so many young people follow him and what he says resonates with them. It's Sunday, so I'm off to meet the church's parishioners and the prophet himself at the service. And with all the bad press, it seems the church takes security pretty seriously. This is it. This is the uh, Church of Incredible Happenings. <laughs> That's a catchy name, isn't it? <laughs> is that the man there? Is that him? That's him. There you go. Umboro. Nice suit. And the prophet has a Facebook and a Twitter page. <laughs> Brilliant. And uh, just in case you didn't get it, their slogan is, it's incredible and it's happening. That's the sort of thing that I would come up with and get laughed at. It's an hour before the main service, but already there's lots of young people here in expectation of some incredible happenings. Are you literally just coming here to, to worship today or are you involved in any way at all? I'm in Asia, I serve people. I'm part of the worship team, part of the worshippers who sing, entertain and bring the spirit down. Worship. Oh, so the choir? Yeah. Yes, part so of you the sing. choir. Right, <laughs> OK. <laughs> A lot of people say that um, Mboro does, does miracles. The prophet is someone who is capable of miracles. Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen any? Yeah, he does, just like plenty me. of miracles. I couldn't walk. He healed me by the, his prayers. Yeah. And then look at me now. It's not just prayer people are buying into. The church shop sells everything from holy salt and holy water to fashion garments. You've got Mboro T-shirts. And you've got refreshments with his face on it as well. It's, um, it's almost more like a concert. And there's like a merch stand. Hello, guys. How are you doing? What are you, what are you selling today? That's Vaseline, right? It's a petrol luxury. Yeah, yeah, OK. And is that, is that his face on it? Yes. It's been anointed by the anointing of the prophet. 
Jesus. So he's blessed this. I used to go to church when I was um, when I was younger in the UK, wow. and the church never had a sales department. <laughs> okay. You know. Oh my God! Wow, this place is massive. Umbora hasn't arrived yet, but already there are thousands of people in the church. They come from all parts of the country, some traveling for days to be blessed by the prophet. Suddenly, the vibe changes. The moment everyone has been waiting for. Surrounded by armed guards and cheering fans, Prophet Mboro has arrived. This might have started like a West End show, but people don't attend just to be entertained. They also come here to be healed of their problems, be it physical, mental, or spiritual. There are things that your education cannot solve. There are things that your money cannot buy. There are things that only God can. Jesus. As a non-believer, and not wanting to pretend to pray, I find myself in an awkward position. I was in hope to go and look for a job, to go and start a business, to stand up again. I will never fail. In Jesus. Boom! I can understand financial problems, but during the service, there are things that I can't quite comprehend. She says her vagina is painful. There's a, there's a beast that came at night. I just want to die. Just want to die. Yes. My man. I need you to pray with me, pray for me. This 22-year-old woman attempted to take her own life as she believes she was raped by an evil spirit. The prophet doesn't shy away from healing this follower's private parts. His word for the vagina is biscuit. Oh my God, he's stepping on me. Hey, hey. This beast is on my biscuit. Let it die. Die! Say Jesus! 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 My vagina is clean. I may have gone to a Pentecostal church, but I've never seen anything like this. After a seven hour show, hands in the air go to hands in the pockets. And now they're all pouring forward to, to put their money in the baskets in the front. According to the Prophet himself, these followers contribute over a million pounds a year to him and his church through donations, events, and buying merchandise.
With the service over, I've been granted a short audience with the Prophet. Hello, I'm yeah. Reggie. Lovely to meet oh, you. Oh, yeah, the Reggie they've been speaking about. Thank you so much for having us at, at your service today. You're quite the entertainer. It was incredible. It was it was almost like a concert almost, you know? Like, you, you oh. were almost like a rock star to some of these guys, the way they were reacting to, to you on stage. For me, I just want to have fun with my people, make them happy while I minister to them. Yeah. So that they can forget where they come from and look where they are and enjoy God in a different way. One of the things that I think is going to definitely stick out in my mind when I leave here today is um, casting the bad spirits out of that, that lady that was lying on the floor. Witchcraft is rife here in, in South Africa. When I was young, I used to be troubled by those spirits talking cats. I know you don't know that. Cats here, they talk and uh, calling my name and things choking me at night. When I received Jesus Christ, the main purpose was to come out of those things. In Africa, we have faith. It's just that we have it in different things. Yeah, real education coming here today. So thank you for having us. No, thank you very much. God bless you. Okay, I don't want to get in the way of your security right. guards there. No, it's fine. They're, They're cool. They're massive. <laughs> See you later. Thanks. Bye-bye. Uh, okay. okay. Uh. As Mboro leaves with his entourage in a fleet of flash cars, I was left bewildered. I can't work out why young people buy into all of this. In all honesty, it was just bizarre today. I mean, the offering culture is something that we have in the UK. You know, but, you know if you see a 20 quid in there, you're going to think, wow, that's, geez, whew, some, someone's gone for it. But here, it's just envelopes. And then, by water that has been blessed, and then by salt that's been blessed, and then by Vaseline that's been blessed. There's lots of things that I want to find out about because, in all honesty, on face value, it's really unsettling. Yesterday's Sunday service was out of this world. If I'm going to understand young people's beliefs here, then I need to know more about the man that they follow. So I've arranged to meet and borrow at his favorite suit shop. Unfortunately, there's no sign of him. So I wait. And I wait. And I wait. You sort of hear loads of things about Africa time, but you don't really get it until you experience it. The word is that um, the longer you wait for someone, the more important they are, or the more important you deem them to be. And um, he's two hours more important than he used to be to me now. I'm not one for waiting on people, so I'm getting started without him. Hello. How, hey, how you doing? I'm Reggie. Hi, I'm Greg. Nice to meet you, Greg. You too. Hello, boss. How you doing? I'm sorry that we are so late. Uh, I've been waiting from Borough for like the last few hours. No and problem. Here, so I figured I'd come and see the place myself. He's quite a flamboyant guy. I mean, what sort of thing does he normally go for? He actually goes for one of our, well, for our top brand, which okay. is a top Italian brand. Well, that's uh, very out there. That's hardly going to have you slip into the background, isn't it? Correct. Who else shops here? Pastors, footballers, Bafana Bafana guys all the hip-hop stars. Where I'm from, the uh, footballers and rappers and entertainers, you kind of expect them to go to the same clubs and the same shops, but yeah, yeah. you wouldn't expect them to shop in the same place as the pastors. Are the pastors here like celebrities as well? They are. The pastors actually are huge celebrities, yeah? How but much is one of these seats going to set you back? They range between 25 and 40,000 Rand. Wow. With suits costing up to 3,000 pounds, this is definitely a shop for the high rollers. After three hours, the celebrity prophet finally arrives with his entourage. As ever, he's dressed to impress. You're looking pretty sharp for a, a quiet, normal Monday. No, I just dressed up to come and see you. Oh, really? <laughs> uh, to put on a tie for you. Oh, really? You must be special. I was going to say, you're making me feel special. <laughs> the way you wear it, it speaks. It tells you who you are. And I know you've got good stuff at home. <laughs> I, I left the good stuff at home, is that I, what you're saying? I know, I know. I, all I know. right, all right, I know what you're saying. I'm also like that, you know, I know. <laughs> so if I'm going to come back to your church this weekend, I need to be dressed appropriately, right? So um, could you help me find something to wear? 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Nah. <laughs> you see one, sure. OK, what's going to be suitable, then? I'm tempted by that crazy gold and black number. <laughs> Can I try? I just want to see it on me. Go on, Tom. Get it on me, Tom. Yeah, that's not happening. Those shoulders are not happening. This is a... Look at that. And look at the monkey arms as well. It's a nice colour. It's a good colour. It looks very... No, but you need it to... Mm. Ah. Show that. Mm. OK. <laughs> <laughs> so what sort of thing would you go for, then? Yeah, that's the, that's the thing. You see, when I come here, yeah. I take... A trolley load, or two, or three, or four. You know? Yeah. I spend over 100 grand just in one day, and I come back again, and it just... Sometimes you know, it can come two, three times in one week. Is it? That's a lot car. of money on suits, though, so, isn't it? That's a, so, a lot so of money on suits. When I buy, I just... Yeah, no, this is nice. I was always taught that Christianity was about being humble and modest, not splashing £7,000 a visit on outfits. Watching him spend money like that on that is actually making my hairs stand on end. And I feel a bit sick. So I've decided not to buy a flash suit for Sunday best. Yeah, and no, I don't think I will get. I don't think I will get one. Yeah, I think what what I should do is, no, be me. And that's what I think I'm gonna is the best thing for me to do. But definitely, you have to to be different. Different. Okay. You are presenting something to another world. What is it you think I should be projecting then? Your image. Your image. You are Reggie. You understand what I'm saying? You know, your, your presentation is not only for you. A lot of people are, in, are still in the, in the hole. They want, when you say, come, let's go, they look at you first. If I wear something also, they say, wow, they get excited. It's about building somebody else. This is my blazer. It's clearly not as expensive. It saves you a lot. <laughs> you save a lot. I think, I think your blazer cost a bit more. A bit more design went into yours. So anyway, she will come and... Perfect. Very right. Sort you out. Thanks, boss. As we normally do. Nice to see you again. Thank you. Come to incredible happenings with Prophet... Like many churches in South Africa, Mboro has his own daily TV and radio shows. He claims to heal and deliver miracles to millions over the airwaves. Don't miss it for anything in the world. God bless you. It's coming close to hair. Today's call-in show is already underway. I'm not sure what I missed, but it sounds serious. Uh, we just received a caller explaining that the daughter's panty, uh, something bad, something very dark is coming out, and the mother is experiencing the tummy has, is, is growing. Those are the evil spirits. I say right now, touch the, the radio. Touch the screen of your television. God will heal you. On Sunday, you can bring your underwear. I'm going to pray for it. It's your point of contact. I'm going to release the power of God through it. Touch wherever you have a problem. Touch your biscuit, touch your vuvuzel, touch your breast, touch yourself, and receive your miracle. I'm praying right now. Say, Jesus, you are healing me now. Devil, you go out. Out in the name of Jesus. Power in the name of Jesus. Touch the radio right now. God is healing you. Tomorrow we are continuing 9 o'clock until 10 o'clock. This is Prophet P.F.P. Mutsuening saying it's incredible. It's happening. Bok! God bless you. It's incredible happenings by Prophet P.F.P. Mutsuening on Kasi FM 97.1. How many sort of people would you get to listen to your show? Uh, well, this is uh, we... over 200,000. 200,000, yes. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Is this an extension of the church? It's an outreach because here yeah, you, you also hear of the disasters that are happening in the communities. Right. Yeah, problems that we didn't know about, uh, touching stories. Then we get involved in that. You, you find what is happening, you can go there to the people and deal with their issues. All right. I'm going to ask you one more question before you go. It sounded like you were asking people to bring their underwear to the church on Sunday yes, yes. because you wanted to, to bless that. That's right. Now, for somebody uh, from, I guess, quite a traditional Christian church, I can imagine them not really getting that. If you have never experienced something like you, where you come from, you have never experienced what we are talking about. But we don't have to wait for you to understand because you are not in this world. You know, in, in our world, uh, you are in another world. 
Dennis Boss. My host. My master. Right. <laughs> my king. You can say that. My again. boss. Oh, again. <laughs> and Borrow's right. I don't understand this form of Christianity. And it bothers me that a man of the cloth can be a self made millionaire. I don't agree with what he's doing. I've said it. I don't. He believes that he's giving a service, he's delivering a service, and therefore he should be paid for it. If you were selling cars, yeah, maybe. But you're not. You're selling hope and faith. After just a couple of days, I've pretty much made up my mind about Mboro. But here, young and intelligent people are devoted to his church. So maybe I'm missing the point. I've come to meet 21-year-old Fifi and Kiki. Good to meet you finally. Um... After Mboro's call out, they're shopping for underwear to be blessed at Sunday service. And I'm determined to get to the bottom of this. Blessing underwear. What issues is that covering? Yeah, a lot of stories with, with, with things that happen under there, you know? I remember where a lady had worms coming out of her biscuit. <laughs> so oh, so they had to, to take a raw liver so that those worms couldn't eat her because mm. that worms eat her if she didn't have any, mm. any kind of liver. I'm trying to get it. Yeah. I'm trying mm. to understand mm. why this is normal in your world, and genuinely, mm. I'm still not Con getting convinced. It. Mm. I'm still not this getting it. I'm black, so we obviously believe that you can be bewitched. Yeah, but I'm black too, and I don't believe it. But you're not but from here. Yeah. Until you go through a certain path right. and understand where other people are coming from, then you'll never understand. Yeah. OK. All right, should we get your underwear then? Yeah, sure. You want to do this? <laughs> I'm sorry, this is just yeah, so bikinis. surreal. How do you decide what pants you're going to show in church? Uh, like... Gorgeous ones. <laughs> <laughs> this is just really surreal for me. I mean, uh, first and foremost, shopping for underwear with women makes me uncomfortable uh -huh. anyway. Um, but sh shopping for underwear hmm, to yeah, show in church. The yeah. bikinis. It's just normal for them. They're just going for it. And she had to open them. Of course, I have to go. And then it's the wrong thing. So a thong's out of the question then, yeah? No, I don't no, like I, thongs. I'm not a big fan of that. Yeah, okay. me too. I think I found the pants that Whoa, I could buy. Yeah. Should I buy a multi-pack so we can bless me for a whole week? For the whole week? Do you guys have triple XL, anyone? Oh, maybe. Triple yeah. XL, no? I'll go with large then. I'll go with large. <laughs> Sunday's undies might be sorted, but I'm really none the wiser. I don't live in a world with evil spirits and demons. To help me understand how real witchcraft is here, the girls are taking me to a place they don't normally like to go. What is that? It's like a roadkill hall of fame over here. In downtown Johannesburg sits Faraday Market, where they sell anything and everything a witch doctor may need for blessings or curses. What would something like that be used for then? Because there's like a, an animal with its guts hanging out, literally <laughs> just there. What do you reckon? This for me is freaking me out. Mm. I don't want to lie. Everything is just disturbing. Yeah. Mm. And, then and for, they also for, for... use human body parts. Well, we believe so. You yeah. Know? So what you're saying that you your, your church believes that uh, a lot of the bad things are happening are down to some of the the workings of places like this. How does that happen then? It boils down to a sacrifice. OK, well, I mean, you guys are you are young, you're very switched on, and you're clearly quite against what happens here. Is that more to do with your religion, or is that more to do with you just not believing that any of this works and it's just strange? We don't... Not that it doesn't work, it does work, hence why we're fighting against it. So do you see yourself as protected by, by the church and by what happens there? I see myself protected by God firstly, and then the prayers at church. I can see that in Fifi and Kiki's world, they need a guardian angel, and Mboro provides that in his church. But as I'm not part of his fold, I'm not protected. 
I'm on my way to go and meet uh, Borrow's legal representation <laughs> because I've been called in to have a conversation about uh, the filming. And Borrow doesn't want to speak to me at the moment and he's got his legal representation to explain exactly why. I feel kind of in trouble. In fact, you know, like when you're a kid and you get in trouble for something you haven't done? That's what I feel like right now. Going. Good to see you. Yeah, really good. Good to see you. Well, what's going on? What's going on? Yes. Uh, basically, we've been sent by um, the Prophet Mboro to come and speak to you about a number of things that he feels uh, very strongly about. For an example, he says if he says to people they must stand up and say, um, leading them with, with prayers in church, you, he noted that you were seated and you know your face just said, okay this is the part where I don't fit in. Do you know what I mean? Okay. And even to him as a leader, it sends negative connotations to say, you know, we respect our father, we respect our prophet, and here comes this man who just wants to do as he pleases. In terms of uh, me taking part in a prayer, um, as I'm not religious, it would be more of a disrespect on my part for me to pretend to pray than for me to not pray at all. Respect him for being the prophet of God that is anointed to be. And that's it, really. Right. But convey the message to him and hope that uh, he at least gives you time, just some time. OK, well, stay in touch, I guess. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Nice. Lovely. Lovely to meet you. I can understand uh, a religious leader having a problem with someone being in their church and not praying. I get that. But the trouble with this conversation is that that feeling of disrespect extends to everywhere, extends outside that, extends to the way I'm talking to him, the things that I'm asking him, of him. And... I think I've just uh, revoked my fan club membership. Hang on a second, is this him? Maybe he's changed his mind, maybe he's decided to come and see me. If that is the case, I'd be very surprised. Yes, he's security. I have no idea what's going on. What I do know is that there's a man in one of this, one of these cars, and part of this fleet of Mercedes, currently surrounded by men with machine guns, coming to see me, and he's pissed. <laughs> so, makes me a little uneasy. I could be going crazy, but he was bloody driving one of those mercs, wasn't he? He's just here and then he's gone. It's ridiculous. This is ridiculous. Oh, dear. The following morning, it's back on. To my surprise, I'm being invited to take a drive into a township with the Prophet and his team. But after yesterday, I'm taking a new approach. Hence the shaved face and the pressed white shirt. I just hope it's up to scratch and up to his, and up to his expectations. <laughs> Hello, guys. Hello, Prophet. Hi, how are how you? you doing? Thank you for giving us another day with you. I appreciate it. I'm going to jump in my little car. It's not, as, it's not as fast as yours, so it might not keep up, so... Go slowly, please. Nah, no, it's cool. All right. Ah! He seemed happy to see me. It was a bit weird, really. I'm eating and running right now, because I'm, I'm officially part of the Prophet's convoy. What was that three Mercedes and a big, shiny Chrysler all heading to this township and they've all got their hazard lights on. It's almost like royalty or an important politician is moving from one part of the city to the next. We're off to a township called Barcelona. Here in South Africa, 12 million people still live in shacks. According to Umboro, every year his church spends over 600,000 pounds helping communities like this one. All of a sudden, the convoy pulls over. 
even a prophet has to eat. I want to grab some... Uh, snacks? Language is difficult. Snacks. And get a snack. <laughs> Without warning, we're mobbed by adoring fans. We've got people screaming at you from the park. What amazes me is that despite having the security team of a rock star, Mboro doesn't have the ego of one, embracing each and every person he meets. Wish I understood. What did she just say? I don't understand what she's saying. She says maybe uh, she will get some blessings. Ah, yes. from the snacks. Yeah, I've already touched him, and then I can feel that he changed my heart. I feel better. Yeah. You know, I'm not the only one who blesses you. You also bless me with your smile. <laughs> Ski! <laughs> wow. Does that mean that we get some free Doritos, then? Yes. No. No? She's wicked. <laughs> so, uh, exactly. Like many of the people Mboro preaches to, he grew up in poverty selling fruit on the side of the road, and he knows how to connect with them. Do you know what's really funny, right? I tend to do a lot of interviews and following around musicians and actors and football stars and celebrities and stuff, and that's the only time that I see things like that happen. No, I'm a people's person. I believe I'm great, I'm special, but I still believe I'm human. And I must put somebody down there up. I don't believe success is just wearing nice clothes and driving cars and looking down at other people. I don't like people like that. Maybe I suffered too much and I was not treated well. When did you suffer? Was it your childhood or...? Yeah, the way I grew up, even when I was a, a pastor. People honour people because of what they have and I didn't have, but I rose with nothing. I took the word, I took faith, I took God. Yeah, let's hit the road. Okay. The sun. <laughs> Off the back of just chatting to him now, it sounds like I'm speaking to a self-made millionaire, you know, which I am. He's quite clearly a celebrity. I mean, look at this. This is insane. And he likes it. In fact, he loves it, which is probably why he switched from his Mercedes to his convertible, so he can be seen <laughs> driving into the township. <sighs> Arriving in Barcelona, the struggles people face here are plain to see. Nearly 45% of black South Africans live in poverty. The country boasts one of the highest crime rates in the world, averaging 50 murders a day. It's hardly surprising the hope that came with the fall of apartheid is now in short supply. When you drop someone like Mboro in the middle of all of this, you can see why they idolize him. You know, he is, at least on the surface level, a man of God. He is wealthy, he's successful, and he's self-made. As soon as we stop, once again, the prophet is in his element. It seems like everybody here, whenever he comes round, all comes out to see yeah. him. Why do people love him so much? If you are ill and they pray for you, you will be healed. I think my judgments are based entirely in my world and in their world. Everything he stands for and everything he says is of value. Mbora is here to meet surviving members of a family hit by tragedy. A 14-year-old boy murdered both his mother and siblings. So when she looked, peeped through the window, she found a kid with an axe, you know, yeah. chopping the mom with an axe. So she was afraid to come out because she heard that the kid is involved in Satanism practice. I just wanted to see what we can do uh, in bringing some changes here. Mbora has already helped pay to rebuild the family home. But there's still a lot of fear and desperation here, so he gathers the family and neighbours inside one of the shacks. Prayer changes things. It doesn't matter where you come from. 
is where you are and where you are going. Now I was poor, but today I'm among, I'm among the millionaires. You live in this, you'll come out as long as a shack is not inside of you. You are special, you are precious. You are black and powerful. You are African power. Let's pray this prayer, dear Jesus. Dear Jesus. I'm a victor. I'm a victor. I'm not a victim. I'm not a victim. I can come out. I can come I can out. succeed. I can succeed. Through Jesus Christ. I don't agree with the blessing of inanimate objects and making people pay for those. But I do love the message that he gives when he's stood in a tin shack with a group of poor people, filling them with hope and encouragement. It's messing with me because that business and all of the dark connotations that I'm throwing at it is helping so many people to feel better about themselves and to feel a level of hope that they can beat the situation that they're actually in. I don't even know what to think. <laughs> The following day, I was supposed to join Mboro on another township visit. But what I really want to understand is why it's acceptable here for the prophet to profit from his congregation. So I decided to cancel our meeting. I might as well talk to the people that know him best, his congregation. I've come to a township called Vosloros to see 18-year-old Sanele, who I met during last Sunday's service. Hello. <laughs> hey, Sanele. Hello. Hi, Reggie. Hello. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. How are you? Is it, I'm good. Is this mum? Yes. Yes, this Hello. is my mum. Hey. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. Here is my little paradise. Uh, I'm a bit disappointed. I've not seen any... Oh, there it is. I was going to say, I can't yes. see any petroleum jelly. No, like, of course this. you have to have it. Have you tried this stuff? Have I tried? I haven't. No. You haven't? He is smouldering on the front, though. Look at that for a face. He's really Isn't got he a... so hot? <laughs> I have you, a hot dad. It's quite funny you refer to him as your dad. Is that what everybody at the church does? Yes, you, you refer him as your dad because he, you take him as a spiritual father. So uh, how much did this cost you then when you when you buy one of 50 these? 50 racks. 50 round. So that's what, three pounds? Do you put it on every day? Yes, I do. I put it on every day. Right, do you know what? I need to do this. I'm going to try some. Ooh, Reggie's trying this. You should probably pray. Oh, I don't know if I want to do that. OK, let's see. What are you praying for? You could probably pray while rubbing it. I like, could be like, uh, God, please do you rash my knees. In the name of Jesus, I pray with the anointing of the prophet. Reggie, you have to say it. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> do you ash my knees? Yeah. I need it. Prophet, help me out. My knees are looking a little grey. Oh, my red. That sounds so fake. Hopefully this will change things in my kneecaps. Oh, my red. And ever. And ever. And then saying the name Amen. of Jesus. I don't know if I should. No, say it, Reggie. Why? OK, wait. Why shouldn't you? Because I don't believe in Christianity, and I think it's wrong for me to say something like that. But Even then... if it is just for, for jokes. I don't think it's fair. OK, so you rather use the prophet's name for jokes, but not Jesus? Um, See, it shows something, Reggie. It what does it shows, show? It shows that as much as you don't believe, you respect the man so much, so why don't you just try him out? Do you think that what you just said sounded like you hold the... Oh. Whoa, what just happened? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't know. <laughs> but I do that know it's freaky. weirding me out. Please tell me that was an accident. Please, please tell me you did that. Was that you? Was that you? Yeah. It was your bag. Oh, OK. Oh, thank goodness. Thank God. <laughs> Oh, wow, really? look at this. This is amazing. Wow, really? look at all this. We have got to go for the boom shakalaka. Of course. The boom, boom shakalaka, shakalaka it is. And what's this, beef? Yeah, this is, this is the chops. Oh, wow, OK. As the rest of the family join us for a meal, the time seems right to ask Sanele and her 23-year-old sister, Tuli, about the thing that bugs me the most. Um, he is doing so much good in terms of providing hope but I struggle with the monetary side of things. You, as the congregation, give a lot of money to the church. No way does have, do I remember him holding a gun to anybody's head and saying, you are forced to give. No. no. It is a personal choice for somebody to give. Well, he's a rich man. He drives a lot of nice cars. He wears expensive suits. I personally wouldn't want to be led by a pastor who doesn't seem to be, how do I put it, progressing in life because I'd really have a problem with that. 
I'd want myself to progress, I'd want myself to get somewhere, why would I want to be led by somebody who's never gone anywhere? That makes sense. So where does he make his money? His life is dedicated to the church. Yeah. So um, if the church didn't take care of him, I'd really have a problem with that. Mm -hmm. And if his life is a reflection of how well his church is taking care of him, then clearly our lives should be a reflection of how well he's taking care of us. Do you not agree? That makes sense. That makes sense, eh? I don't know if I agree, but it makes sense. Okay. It yeah. makes total sense. See you later, guys. Right. Speaking to the girls, I realised that Mboro's followers are happy to pay him generously for his services. They don't feel the Prophet is exploiting them at all. So I wonder if I've misjudged him. Unfortunately, I may not even get the chance to tell him face to face. Cancelling our meeting yesterday hasn't gone down too well with the Prophet. I've just had a text from Umboro. Made time, you're not avail. You make time and not avail. Um, I kind of get from that he's a little bit annoyed and that he isn't going to make time for me to see him today. So um, I'm just going to call him and see if he's uh, gonna let me come round. Yeah, he so knows the on. The fire of God is burning every satanic attack, every satanic spirit, in the name of Jesus. All the powers of witches and wizards, Satan worshippers. Well, I think he saved my number to don't answer. <laughs> uh, well, that, I guess, is that. And as if on cue, the heavens open. I'm not sure if it's a sign, but I've decided to take my chances with the prophetic rings and the prophet's fury and attend early to catch and borrow before Sunday's service. Oh, this is gonna work, let's hope they let me in. Here we go. Hello, mate. Oh, that was a, that was a funny look. <laughs> I gave him away when he just gave me a big old stare. I have no idea if the Prophet will give me the time of day to explain myself, but I'm gonna try anyway. Hey man, you all right? Hey, how's it going? It'd be really great to come in and join the congregation today. Is it possible to? Like... The problem is, here in South Africa, in my space, I've got the way I do things. If people don't honor their words, I don't take it. Is that the problem? Do you think that I've acted bigger than, yes. than the church? Yes. Uh, that's, that's not the case at all. I think it's just a miscommunication. That's the problem. The way you talk, we don't speak like that in South Africa. There's a, there's a level of respect, Reggie. You don't have it. Okay. Understand here, yeah, when you talk to anybody, we have white people here, but you're whiter than white people. I don't like arrogance. I don't like pride. Humble yourself. You are big in your world. You are in, a, in somebody's world. Humble yourself, go down, understand what is happening in other people. I've never had my blackness questioned before. As much as that offends me, I kind of understand why Mboro is so upset. Up until a couple of days ago, I was very cynical about the Prophet and his church. But yeah, in all honesty, I'm, I'm not mad at the man. I'm not angry at the man, I get it. I want to see the service with open eyes, and luckily, the Prophet has agreed to let me in. I'm so blessed to talk to people like you. You are the best thing ever happened to me. Ha! A few minutes into the service, and it seems Mboro has chosen me as this week's sermon. Reggie and uh, Yates, right. Yeah. Give it up for Reggie Yates. You will come on the stone. Okay. <laughs> what about the incredible happen? 
Thank you. Uh, you mentioned literally outside when we were talking the idea of different worlds. I am from a completely different world to you. And culturally, I'm from a very different world as well. And I understand that the way that you worship is eternally different to the way that my family or I might have experienced. Does that make sense? You were never bewitched in your life. You never woke up one day and found yourself with a rotten leg and the doctor's telling you it has been amputated and then for you to be okay. Why do I have the people who come here? These are the people who chose, I will not give up, I will not give in my problems, my situation. I'm going to find something beyond science, beyond human understanding to come out of my problem. I don't necessarily understand it and a lot of the things that, that, you, um, that you preach, a lot of the things that happen here in South Africa, I don't agree with all of them, but what I do think that I'm gonna take away from this trip is what you give these people. I can see that you give everybody in here hope, so respect. You know, a lot of people watch you and watch what you do and are fans of you, and I was blown away when I went to the shop and I saw that you had these T-shirts. <laughs> it looks good on me, right? Yeah? Well, that's me. That's me. <laughs> Power! It's you, isn't it? See? I'm learning, I'm learning. Uh, it's good to have you. God bless you. We've made our peace. Now, the show must go on. It's time to bless. And we'll leave it off. <laughs> and Boris just seen mine. <laughs> what is this? <laughs> do you like what I'm doing or not? We do. Must we stop? No. Because somebody doesn't like it? No. Just touch it, let me pray. The fire of the Holy Spirit. Touch! In the name of Jesus, I come against you, beasts, you animal. Nasi sluani siapu. Nasi sluani siapu. Faith is a crazy powerful thing. All invisible demons, I flush them out. As a non-believer, I'm not sure if I will ever fully understand people waving their underwear or holding their private parts in church. But like Mbora would say, we are from different worlds. It's incredible. It's happening all the time. <laughs> all right, done. Thank you so much. I've stolen his catchphrase. Nice to meet you both. Take care. Lovely to meet you both. Hope to see Take you care. soon. Yes. Bye. Take care. Bye. 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 Just a few days ago, I'd made him borrow out to be a charlatan. I can see now that says as much about me as him. I didn't expect that at all. I didn't understand the importance of faith coming out here, you know. I, um, I now know what faith can do. I don't know if it's what I want, but I get it. And more importantly, I think I respect it. And I didn't a week ago. South Africa, the continent's biggest success story and one of the most stunning countries in the world. It's being a tourist, don't judge me. I'm way too cool for things like that. But this country has a very dark past. As a black man, I wouldn't have even been allowed to set foot on this very beach just 20 years ago. For over a century, a white supremacist government controlled the nation and brutally oppressed black people. They've got no education. They've only just come down from the trees. This system of racial separation was called apartheid and was only abolished in 1994 when Nelson Mandela and the ANC came to power. Today marks the dawn of our freedom. 
there has been such extreme levels of segregation here and knowing that that ended only two decades ago, I'm desperate to see how that has changed the lives of people just like me, if at all. Poverty is rife here. And today people talk of a new underclass emerging. It's not black people. That's the way to do it. But why? I can't imagine anything worse than waking up in there. We are going to take that belongs to us. With years of hatred to overcome. They're going to kill us. And both sides still playing the race card. Most white people learned black people the things they know today. I want to find out what life is like for the young white South Africans. Some of them are very racist. Who think they are now bottom of the pile. It's not a place to live here. Not for the children. If you are black, you're better off. If I was a white guy, that would piss me off. And discover whether the nation will ever move on from its tortured past. Stupid man. We will never agree. Never. That's why the world is a fucker. Johannesburg, South Africa's biggest city. 20 years on from apartheid, some people claim that this country is still governed by racist policies. Only this time, they say it's white people, not black people, being oppressed. What the white experience of Africa is, for me, is really, really intriguing. Some people believe since the ANC came into power, there's been a flip because all of the opportunities have been afforded to the black people and the white people are now second-class citizens and are being neglected. But that can't be the case, surely. On the edge of the city lies a notorious camp called Coronation Park, a place where some of the hardest-hit white South Africans have made their home. Coronation Park fills me with a little bit of apprehension and that apprehension is based on the way that they may take me the way they may receive me and the way they may judge me straight away because I'm a privileged young black man. This made me a little bit more nervous <laughs> thinking about it. During apartheid, Coronation Park was a picnic place for white middle-class families, but it's become something very different. Oh, this is it. A permanent home for a white underclass. It's a camp in the middle of a park. They're living in a rough trailer park. In the UK, you sort of get used to seeing images of young black kids in poverty, and I've never seen those same images, but with white children. I'm really thrown by that. It's... Outsiders aren't generally welcome. All new arrivals need permission to be here from the camp leader, Irene, who's lived here for eight years. She's agreed to let me stay. To see white people in South Africa barefoot in a settlement in a park, that's blowing my mind. Yeah. <laughs> because that is not what we see uh, across, you know, across the pond. I mean, we don't yeah. see that in, in Europe. What's the common thread? What normally brings people here? I don't know. I think because they lost everything, there's no jobs for the white people. That understand me, I'm not racist or there's no jobs for our white people. You want pay check away from this place. Mm. Because something can happen to you and you will end up here. The settlement sort of stretches all the way down. Can we have a little look? Do you mind yes, taking me sure. around? Yes, sure, I will okay? take you around and you can check. Coronation Park, it's like a white squatter camp. Yeah. It's like you can stay here and uh, we will look after you. Do they build their own shacks? Do they have to pay to be here? No, they don't pay to be here. That's literally a shed, is that? Does someone live in this? In the back of it, yeah. Wow. How many people are there in Coronation Park? Uh, 287. Hello. Hello. We're running on generators. We haven't got power yet. With no proper sanitation and dozens of stray animals roaming around, Health is a real concern. The government has repeatedly tried to shut the camp down as new people arrive all the time. How you doing? I'm, I'm Reggie. What's your name? JD. JD, hello. 27-year-old artist JD turned up last month with his mum, two kids 
and pregnant wife. That's absolutely beautiful. That's what I do. I travel the whole country, painting and drawing all over the place. So where have you come from? Originally from Cape Town. How have you ended up here in Coronation Park? I've been hit by life, you know? Hit to my knees. You know, it's difficult for white folks these days. It really is. We don't have the ball in our court anymore. Um, we are not the chosen ones, if you want to put it that way, and it's the truth. Most white South Africans are descended from Dutch settlers and called Afrikaans. During apartheid, they saw themselves as a superior race. We cannot mix with the lower nations unless they are cultivated. Given the best jobs and education, creating a super wealthy white elite. In 1990, everything changed. The leader of the black resistance, Nelson Mandela, was released from prison. While over 50% of privately held assets here are still owned by the white minority, Africana charities believe a new underclass has formed, with many living in settlements just like this one. Where should I put my tent? Where's a good place to pitch up? What do you mean, there? We're going to put it on the ash. <laughs> Will you guys help me put on my tent? Yeah. Come on, then. What are we doing? There we go. All right, let's peg this up. Yay. I've only stayed in the tent once before. And um, while I was making it, I wasn't getting whipped in the ass by some, uh, some kid called Winston. <laughs> when did you do this? Oh, look, 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 look. Yeah. Hey. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Nearly a third of all the people living here are under 16. I'm not sure how the future looks for teenagers like Winston. Do you think you'll always live here? I don't know. Do you want to move out of here? Yes. Why? It's the people that's only drinking and fighting, kicking. Really? So if you do move out of here and people ask you where you grew up when you're older, when you're my age, are you going to say Coronation Park? Why? Some people is going to make fun of me. Are you going to look after me and give me some um, sandwiches <laughs> and tea before bed? No, I'll give you some food. <laughs> Can I help out? After dark, more young people flood into the camp. As well as child benefits, many residents survive on handouts, including hot drinks and sandwiches given out three nights a week. You ask them how much coffee they want. Say, who feel? Who feel? Coffee. Coffee. Drink yay. Drink yay. That's right. Coffee or tea? Coffee or tea? Learn Afrikaans. Check that out. How you been, man? You had a good day? What have you been doing? Um, drinking. <laughs> drinking today? This is the pain. Hey, evening. He's a little mad. I didn't think about what the rain would do here. Unemployment here is very high. One person who does have a steady job is Irene's son, Kheri. He works as a welder. Hey, Hedy. I'm good, thank you, man. I've not met you before. I'm Reggie. Hello. Hello, lovely to meet you. Is that your wedding pictures I can see yeah. over there? You scrub up well, don't you? Yeah, so You looks good in a suit. <laughs> Flowers from the wedding day. Yeah. You've still got them. <laughs> I don't want to grow them. <laughs> yeah, right. Despite Hedy working, his wage isn't enough to cover rent for a proper house for his wife and three kids. Just how difficult is it to raise a small child in, in a place like this? It is difficult because the generator is on, but when you sleep at night and he wakes up, the generator isn't on. Then you must struggle to get light and what, whatsoever. Oh. And there isn't always hot water because you must make fire to get hot water. So yeah, that's a problem. Do you worry about how um how, how healthy a situation it is for him, because I'd imagine yes, that it's probably quite easy for him to get ill. It's dirty, you know. Especially with the small one uh, and Zander, they, they get sick fast, you know. It's not a place to live here, not for the children. I can't live here anymore. I tried my best from the start. I, I was working since I was 16, you know. Um, 
and from then I, I, I just tried, you know, uh, build up my education and, and, and try to be what I am. You look quite emotional. Yeah, yes. Yeah, when it like... comes to my kids and my wife, yeah. What is it about your family that makes you so emotional? Uh, I think it's because uh, I know I try hard, you know. Uh, maybe I don't try hard enough, I don't know, but to, to see them suffer like this, it, it makes me... Do you think your children are suffering? Um, well, they don't have the life w what I want for them, you know, and I, I, I think that for them is suffering, you know. The harsh reality of being at the bottom of the ladder out here is that that can happen to you. This is it for them. Yeah, kind of keep you awake, wouldn't it? The next one on for you. You're gonna chop off my fingers, bro. You don't need your fingers. Ah, uh, come on, bro. You slap you like a saucy man. <laughs> Use this thing, bro. That's the way to do it. You're gonna go out smelling like smoke, like you don't do, bro. I can live with that so long as I'm warm. What was your first night like here? Terrible, because it felt like there's a bunch of serial killers staying. <laughs> I'm really glad I asked you this question after my first night. Sleeping here as a grown man is one thing, but in a few months, JD will have a newborn baby to share his tent with. How does it feel knowing that your newborn will be brought here? I'm talking to Irene and them. They all know about the baby coming. And I know in my heart it will be OK, because they're going to help us. They will help us. I've heard about it recently. I've read in the papers that the people around here might qualify for government housing. But Why wouldn't you, though? I mean, if ever there was anybody that needed help, particularly with a baby on the way, I would have thought that you'd be, you'd be perfect for it. To me, government housing is, is, is a dream. <laughs> I don't quite... Um, I, don't, I don't see myself qualifying for a government housing. Over two million people are waiting for social housing in South Africa. So it's no surprise that JD doubts his chances of getting one. The wider situation is even more complicated, as race still plays a part in some opportunities here. I've come to the centre of Joburg to meet an old mate of mine, celebrity DJ Sizway, to get a different perspective. What's happening now for young black South Africans? Oh, Rich, what's up? How you doing? It's been years. <laughs> I'm well, thanks. How's it going with good you? See. I'm really good, man. I'm really good. I'm glad to be in, a, in your neck of the woods, as it were. OK, let's go to where you know. Take you where the girls are. <laughs> You're desperately trying to get me in trouble, my it's girlfriend, all is a right? Good, it's a good start. <laughs> Sizwe is what's known here as a black diamond, a young black guy with a very healthy bank balance. People refer to you as a black diamond. I guess some people would. <laughs> I'm a diamond in the rough. <laughs> I need some polishing. <laughs> but people like Sizwe are relatively rare. Most of the wealth here is still in the hands of the old white masters, and they live in lavish, gated communities. Is this one property? Yeah. The houses are just obscene. There's a huge gap in SA between those that have and those that don't. Is that why the walls are so high and the security? That's why the so... walls are so high. I mean, look, this is barbed That's wire. Like, There's electro... gates. Yeah, electronic fences. Yeah. To try to rebalance wealth and opportunity, the government has brought in a policy called Affirmative Action, AA for short. It's already transformed areas like the courtroom where over 60% of the most senior judges are now black. And the dream is to repeat that across all walks of life. In SA, if you are black, you're better off right now. Well, why is that? Because it wasn't the case 20 years ago. Just because of everything, man. Like, the odds are stacked to your favor now. Affirmative action. If I applied for a job, right, and a guy my age 
same education as me, about for the same position, uh, but he was white, I'd get the job, hands down. I mean, as a, if I was a white guy, that would piss me off. Thank you, brother. You all right? If you're talking to Sizwe in the car, you know, one of the things that kept coming up was the, um, the swing of power and the white people feeling marginalised, you know, and feeling that they don't get the opportunities anymore. Reverse racism, I guess. It's a very different time now. And if you're black, you will get opportunities in the way that you never used to. I've grown up thinking equality is about treating everyone the same. But here, things are different. Until the 90s, on these very streets, the ruling whites, or Boers, treated black people as little better than animals. Don't like apartheid, because in apartheid, Europeans go up and Africans go down. They were forcibly removed from their homes to live together in massive ring fence compounds, which later grew into townships. Everything was ruthlessly enforced by the white regime. I want to find out what it was like living under white rule on these streets. So I've come to meet 28-year-old Colin. He grew up in Alexandra, a township still full of black people, many living in poverty. As a kid, you were actually, well, I guess, old enough, seven or eight, to remember. So between that age, yes. Yeah, to remember some of the things that happened during apartheid. What, what sticks out in your mind during that era? I remember when we called them the Melo Yellow Vans. It was the police state vans. Immediately, you see that yellow van. You knew you had to run to save your life because you never knew what would be predicted from the police or the state police. Because at times, they would just literally stop to beat you up or not want you to congregate in the streets in groups. And even today, you know, police these are not the most likeable people in the townships, for example, for that matter. People see a, a police van, they see their enemy. In the mind of somebody like myself from the UK, when we think of segregation, the first thing that comes to mind is, is the US in the 60s and the, the struggles of black people in America. But this was going on in the 90s. In the 90s, yes. Is, I mean, It's so hard to get your head around. That's unbelievable. I mean, the last time it happened, it is 1994, which is, sounds like yesterday. Black people who broke the apartheid laws were sent to prisons like this one, called the Old Fort. Nelson Mandela was incarcerated here whilst awaiting trial. The only time you would find white wardens in this section, it was when they came to render humiliation towards the black prisoners. They would perform a strip search dance called the Tausa dance. Strip search dance? What was the dance? The dance stipulated you strip naked, you spread your legs, you spread your arms, clap the hands above the head, leap in the air making a clicking sound, stretch your legs, like stretch your legs. And if no object had fallen down, then the authorities would go in an extent of inserting a finger or a torch inside their rectums to see if there's nothing hidden. It was a alleged torch. that a torch. Men and women. Men and women, yes. Wow. The most severe punishments were reserved for those who fought to change the system. These freedom fighters were kept in solitary confinement as a warning to others. Political leaders were sent here. It was the most severe form of punishment. Lying down flat on the ground, you feel like you're lying down in a grave. So there weren't beds in here, there weren't a desk, there weren't chairs. There were no chairs. On the floor. They were locked up here for 23 hours and only released for an hour of the day. I guess this is where uh, prisoners were chained to. It's amazing to think South Africa has gone from official government brutality towards black people to affirmative action, from just my parents' generation to mine. There's been so much injustice here that the anger is still so fresh. And just putting my mum's face to this environment makes me angry. And that's just imagining it, not living it. On face value, it's bang out of order that white people aren't being given the same opportunities as black people. But when you think about how long it's been weighed in the favour of the minority, you can understand why it's been put in place. I'm not saying that I agree with it, but what I am saying is I get why so many people are still angry 
and why they think that it is imperative that it's in place. Although black and white South Africans now enjoy all the same freedoms, Statistics South Africa claims that nearly 16 million black people still live in poverty here. On that level, extra help for them makes sense. I'm holding the bat the right way, it's a good start. But I'm not sure where that leaves the squatters in Coronation Park. I can't help wondering what people like Irene make of it. After being part of the privileged minority, for years. Do you think that it's fair? Do you think it's right? I think, yeah. Uh, you do? If, you, you know what? You know what? If, that's what I say, and I say it today, if our fathers and our fathers and fathers and fathers treat the black people like normal people and didn't um, let them work like, like slaves and treat them like dogs, maybe it would be different today. That's, that's the way it's life. Because yeah. it's time now for us to pay for what our fathers did. And there's nothing you can do about that. Irene strikes me as being resigned to her fate, but her son, Kheri, is desperate to get his family out of here. Your mum said that she thinks it's almost a little bit like a balance now. It's almost more fair for the black people. Do you agree with that or disagree? I think that's bullshit. 20 years ago, I still had fuckle. So now I've got nothing, now they, they think it's balanced out. What happened years ago with, with the black people and the white people was nothing to do with me. I wasn't there, I didn't fight the battles with the white people and the black people. So you're saying your generation have done nothing to deserve this, is that no, how you no. feel? Yeah, that's how I feel. Most, most white people learned black people the things they know today, mm. especially in my company as well. And at the end, they walk out, get a better job with my knowledge, and we sit in the shithole where we are today. But they feel marginalised. They feel that they're still suffering from the people that, 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 that caused the apartheid, you know? The time when, when it was like the Bure, when they called themselves Bure, had the country in their hands. There was more food in our country, more job opportunities. That was also the apartheid, though, right, when the Bure was in charge? Yeah. But so they still, was... still the black people had jobs, and they were still... They had uh, no rights, though. Yeah, they didn't have, have rights. But even though white people, what rights do we have? No, but then at that time, it wasn't anything like now. Yeah, it wasn't. Can't I, I can't say, because I wasn't there. It's a black government, it's a black country. They don't want, want white people, yeah. That's what I think. Some of the stuff that he said made my blood boil. I don't agree with his views but he wants a better life for his son and he feels that the way things are, that's just not going to happen. Being in this and this being your world in its entirety, I understand why you might feel that way. It may sit uncomfortably, but at least part of the reason Kheri is stuck here could be because of affirmative action. And if it continues, I worry that Coronation Park could keep growing, creating more race resentment for young people in South Africa. It's mad how different this place is in the dark, isn't it? I just think it's a bit more intimidating because you just don't know where you are, what's around, and um, what you're walking into, you know? Definitely is a different vibe here. <laughs> hey, guys. Hi, hi. <laughs> but for the true to... camp experience, you have to sit in the stump. There's a very dangerous spider around you. In Afrikaans, you call it a suck spinnacle. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that thing can kill you. Why are you saying that before I sit down on the stump? <laughs> I don't want a suck spinnacle <laughs> getting in my bum. If the way things are set up here, there are so many hurdles for you to get back to where you were. There are things in the way that aren't your fault. And that just makes me angry. I can't really say it's not my fault. I ended up here for a reason. Nobody comes in here just because the country screwed up. Nobody comes in here like that. They come in here because they screwed up. Can't blame everything on the system. No, that's the first time I've heard ownership since I've been here. <laughs> ownership. <laughs> it's the first time I've heard ownership. Even a rich guy can find himself here in two weeks. Ask me. I've lost everything. I lived a dream. I was a rock star. Oh, in my head, I still am. <laughs> I used to sign 
boobs for a living, you know? <laughs> and I, you I, I had a selfish life, but I lived the dream. Mm -hmm. I did. And everything that went along with it, I had. And I lost it in a couple of days. Just a few years ago, JD was living in his own house with a pool. But since his music career ended, he struggled to find his feet in modern South Africa and has been moving with his mum from place to place. This camp is full of people who've left their homes but don't know where they'll end up. Coronation Park isn't the only place that poor whites are squatting. Local newspapers report there are now over 80 camps dotted around Pretoria. This was once the spiritual homeland of the Afrikaner nation, but in modern South Africa, the idea of a nation where white people are in charge clearly has no future. It's not like a, a block of flats in its most traditional sense, but it definitely looks run down. It seems to be both black and white here as well. This settlement is an abandoned care home. As well as the poor Afrikaners, it's home to lots of recent black immigrants from all over the continent. Black or white, this place really does feel like the end of the line. I'm Reggie. That's what I'm out of this. Hello, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Hello, yes. can we come in? Yeah, come in. Is that all right? Yeah. Hello. Hi. Hey, how you doing? I'm, uh, I'm Reggie. Vivian. Nice to meet you, Vivian. Is this your little one? Too. Is that your Is that your youngster? Yeah. Is that your baby and this, this one here? This is my first one. This okay. is my second one. Oh, wow, congratulations. So is this your family in here then, yeah? Yeah. How old are you guys? I'm 20 and he's 24. How long have you guys lived here then? Uh, we've lived here for basically four years now. Who else lives in here? Because there's doors all the way down the corridor and they're all sealed. It's only white. It's only white. There's um, no black in, in those rooms. There's three or four other buildings here. Do the blacks sort of keep to themselves? Yeah. Most of the time. Most of the time, Most yeah. Of the time. Why do you think that is? Some of them are very racist. And inside, yeah, they're also very racist. Yeah. Most of the people, if they do know you and they do have respect for you, they actually just intend to leave you alone. You leave them alone, they will leave you alone. The only other place where I've heard someone speak like that is prison. <laughs> That's the only other place where I've heard people speak about That's like that, looking yeah. after yourself. Is that how you see yeah. this? That's how it works here in this place. So, yeah. Do you know what? I'd love to see the, um, the rest of this building. Is it possible for you to show me around? Yeah. Can I see some more? It's a bit dark down here. So yeah, no kidding. My grandmother's staying here. Well, Vivian's grandmother, actually. Wow, so it's the whole family all in this. Yeah, well, it's the mother. The little one just here. <laughs> Go. It's the grandmother and Vivian's mother that actually got us here, oh, so... So what's this through here? Is this shared? Everything's shared, but unfortunately not everything works either. The toilets, the, they're permanently blocked. These tubs, they don't work at all. They got water, but only cold water. Yeah. Showers. Hey, look at that. Needles, drugs. So that's everywhere now? Yeah. Too many drug dealers moved in, too many junkies moved in. We all know that it's not safe for the kids. Yeah. Crime is rife here. But that's not the only danger. These buildings are so old, if these roofs catch fire, it's, it's over, it's done. Two months ago, a resident built a fire in their room to keep warm. Unfortunately, it got out of control and tore through an entire building. This is awful. Do people actually live in here still? Do people still actually live here? God. 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 There's at least a roof over their heads. I can't imagine anything worse than waking up in there. I think in, what, 20 minutes it was the whole wing. This is the, the hardest I think I've seen it in, in South Africa, you know. So what's the future look like for your, uh, your little girl then? In South Africa, I wouldn't say too good. Neither Hardest nor Vivian have a legitimate job. To get by, they run an unlicensed shop out of their window. 
it's difficult for us to get work in South Africa, especially yeah. me. When I just moved into Pretoria 2010, I had 60 CVs that I actually uh, gave out, resumes that I gave out to places, and it's difficult to find work in South Africa. Not even once is I'm gonna call you back, nothing. Why do you think it's so hard? Working places are racist as well. Not racist. You need more black em uh, employment than whites. Yeah. It's, it's how they work. If, you, if your skin color is not correct, unfortunately, you're not going to get it. And this is at quarter for not my back here. With no job, the family lives hand to mouth. So tonight's dinner depends on the little money the shop makes, which today was nothing. Unfortunately, there's no money to buy anything tonight, but I've still got some macaroni left and soup, so. That's what we'll be eating tonight. Macaroni and soup. That's what you have here, yeah? That's what I have here for now. I don't want to seem judgmental or anything, but just, it almost feels like this isn't... This isn't a life. <laughs> like anyone, I find it hard to witness poverty. But here in South Africa, it is very common. Their Institute of Race Relations claims a staggering 45% of black South Africans also live below the breadline. But that doesn't make the plight of poor whites any easier to stomach. I can hear some music playing. Who's playing that music? Uh, all the rich people. What? Do the uh, rich guys come round here and park up their cars, play music and yeah, hang out? Yeah, you know? When I was like these people, I was exactly the same way. <laughs> Can you believe it's two different worlds? <laughs> Can you believe it? Huh? Can, I, can, I, can I be completely honest with you? Yes. Do. When you spoke about rich people, in my head I had white people. Yeah, not at and all, eh? They're all, they're all black guys. They're all black guys. Look at those people there. Most of them are young people. So, they're getting what they deserve now. Fairness. Is this fair? Their moms and dads wasn't treated this way. They wouldn't have been allowed to come in here. So them enjoying their freedom, there's nothing wrong with that. You should go and ask them what they think about Coronation Park. And you'll get your answer. I'm gonna do that now. Hello guys, how are you doing? Hello. Hello. Where have you guys come from tonight? Soweto. Soweto? Yes. So you guys are from the township? Yes. Nice, and you come out here to enjoy yourself for the night? Yes. <laughs> South Africa has come a long way. Some middle class black people live in Soweto now, with cars, jobs and money. And whilst it's strange to think this party wouldn't have even been allowed 20 years ago, it's even stranger that it is happening right next to the tents and shacks of hundreds of impoverished Africans. There's a group of people living just over there. Permanently uh, standing, they uh, live uh, there. living there or what? You didn't, you didn't know that they, that they were there? No, I didn't know anything because this is a park. Mm. I'm living in that squatter camp tonight. You won't get white people here. You understand? Because what do you... You won't get white people living in the park? You won't. Well, I'm saying there you prove tonight, something? I'm standing there tonight and there's a lot. A, okay, white people that are standing, you know, white people that are living there, they are th three days and then they're going home. No, eight years. No, you're lying. You don't believe that there could be that many white people living that way over there? Why not? I don't believe. Why not? I'm, I'm telling you straight, you're lying. No. I came over this hill expecting sort of arrogant, rich white kids. <laughs> it was quite the opposite. White families still earn six times more than black ones on average. So I can understand the stereotypes. I hold them too. But if black people can't even accept white poverty, I can't see a way out for JD, Hardis and Khiri. I'm on my way back to see Hardis. I'm surprised to hear he's been given a last minute job interview. It could be good news, but I'm finding it hard to be positive. I see his kids walking around barefoot and I see used needles in the gutter and drug dealers hanging out seconds from his open doorway. It just really gets you down. It just makes you think, Jesus. That's interesting. There are police. Wow. Lots of police. I'm going to go and find out what's going on.
Excuse me, officer. If you go inside that side in that building, all the people is inside there. Is there something happened in that building? I don't know if something's happened, but all the blind people are inside that building. Okay. Well, thank you. Something's going on. Hey, Haris. What's up? You alright, man? Yeah. So what's, what's that? Bring me few rookies. They're busy doing a raid. For drug dealing? Uh, drugs, um, cigarettes. If you got a shop, if they find any cigarettes on you, they're going to confiscate it. Why are you guys there, man? Cause well, luckily, I'm a smoker, so I'm just going to say I smoke it. Uh, Vivian, I noticed that your, uh, your shop signs come down. So if they'd seen the sign, what would have happened? They will search the room. If they find anything, they will lock me up. Vivian. Or they will give me a fine. Vivian and Hardis have been lucky, but escaping arrest isn't how I choose to prepare for a job interview. It's going to look like the Rainbow Nation today. Oh, really? Why New is that? shoes with black. Crazy yeah. colours. Yeah. Do you not have any blacks and whites? No. There's dark. There we go. That work? <laughs> it's funny, no matter where you are in the world, there's wives still dressing their husbands. Bye-bye, <laughs> Sienna. See you, no. Hardis is interviewing for a door-to-door -door sales job. Looking sharp, hello. Look at you. All right, let's go do this. <laughs> it's a massive opportunity that doesn't come around very often. I applied for this job two years ago. Wow. Two years ago, and they finally um, called you out of the blue. Yeah. Uh, this is a good 30 minute drive from your place. How are you going to get here should you get the job? Walk. This is going to be a long walk, isn't it? <sighs> get those nerves. You'll be fine. Sorted out. You'll be fine. So what's the situation with um, AA? I'm hoping that there's no, no such thing in, in this opportunity. Even if there is, I'm still hoping that um, I get con I, I convince them to actually give me the chance. This is the first time I've actually seen him appear unsure about something, you know? In any scenario, you'd sort of understand, but in this one, there's so much more on his shoulders, you know? It's not just someone trying to get a job to earn some money to pay for their satellite subscription. I really hope Hardis can get his dream job. But competition is tough. This is just the first of three interviews he'll have to ace to stand a chance. Even if he does succeed, his ultimate goal is not just to leave his home, but to take his family out of South Africa. Like many Afrikaners I've spoken to, he's fearful for the future. I've come to a rally for a popular movement called EFF that's taking South Africa's poor black youth by storm. The Red Berets think affirmative action hasn't gone far enough. They're demanding more extreme measures to help black people out of poverty, like taking back farmland and nationalizing lucrative mines. We are going to take that belongs to us. They've become controversial for singing an apartheid rebellion song, Shoot the Boer, Kill the Farmer. Viva EFF, viva! Old women to little kids, they're all screaming. Viva EFF. Just because there's now a black government doesn't mean poor black Africans aren't still suffering or angry. We're going on 20 years of so-called independence. I'm only free to sit next to a white person on a bus, but I got no income, I got no money. I cannot buy anything for my children. My children just watch life going by. Talking to people like Hardis, you sort of get an idea that he feels like he's not part of what's happening in South Africa. He's no different to the people here. You know, they feel just as marginalised, just as, as not listened to and just as ignored. You know? People here want change, and there's a militancy in the air. Look at that, look. It's bad. When their commander-in-chief, Julius Malema, turns up, he gets a welcome that David Cameron could only dream of. Now you must not sit back. Come on, son. Pull out the guitar. Hello, yeah. This the poor, the farmer. This the poor, the farmer. The whole 
whole time I've been here, I've heard about this Kill the Boer song. Uh, clearly, Malemba has become hip to that because, you know, it's something that's really sensitive to the, uh, the Boer and Afrikaans population out here. He's now changed the words of the song to Kiss the Boer. The funny thing is, that's quickly followed by uh, people going pow, pow. Different words, pretty much the same meaning, you know? I've never seen any politician in Britain do was sing with the people and sing traditional songs. Yeah, yeah. And he sang the, the Kill the Boer song, but he uh, changed the words to Kiss the Boer. Yes. No, do you to, think it's a fair song? Boer. Yeah, it's a fair song. We are kissing the knowledge. We do not want to fight. We want to fight spiritually, not physically. We don't want to fight with guns and whatever. We have to fight knowledgeable, uh, 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 knowledgeably. And we, we have to fight with knowledge. I don't want to believe that everyone here wants to take violent revenge on white people, but chanting a hate song isn't building any bridges. A few years ago, Julius Malema was tipped as a future president, but he's not someone many people in Coronation Park would vote for. Why do you think that so many black people in townships are supporting of Malema? Because they want to kill us. <laughs> it's a shock, eh? I definitely don't agree. He says kill the boot, kill the white one, kill the boot, kill the white one. They're going to kill us. They're going to kill us. As soon as he comes in, we're going to be killed. Our fathers before our fathers treated black people very bad. They did. And I think Julius Malema wants to just turn it around. But it's wrong. It's wrong. So why do you want to treat us uh, like dirt? Because of what happened that time of year. It was a long time ago, but it's not that long ago. The fact that people are still alive who remember apartheid is a problem. The fact that there are still people who are holding on to feelings from that era is a problem. And that is why there are some people, not all people, some people who feel a level of resentment and why there is anger between blacks and whites. <laughs> That's what I can't. Blood, 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 blood is blood and flesh is flesh, so just leave it. There are lessons in what happened, and I think the only way that you move forward is learning from what happened as opposed to forgetting. You know what? Stupid, man. There's people in this world, that's why the world is like it is, because they can't forgive and forget what happened in their lives. That's why the world is a fuck up. Straight talking, breaking no friendship. That's why the world is fucked up. But to forget what's happened will be completely irresponsible because then you can't learn from what went wrong. And that is why, wait, hear me out, Irene. Hear me out, hear me out, Irene. I tell you, I told yeah, you now no. what I think about the light. Yeah. I told you anything I know, everything that I know, everything I want to say to you. Yeah. And that's that. We're not going to agree we on it. We will never agree. <laughs> never. Let me tell you one thing, my friend. We will never agree. Forgiving and forgetting is, um, is not the way I live my life. I mean, I've got a tattoo on my arm that says, never regret, never forget, you know? Um, I think it's important that you don't forget. It's definitely important that you forgive, and that's the only way that things are going to change here, if people forgive. But you must never forget. Because if you forget, what the hell are you going to learn? There is no quick fix for the divisions and inequality in South Africa. The poor Afrikaners I've met are undoubtedly getting a rough deal now. But if there is a price to pay for decades of oppression, perhaps this is the least worst option. In Pretoria, Hardis has asked me to meet him after making it through to the final interview for his sales job. OK, so today was the big day. Got some bad news and some good news. OK, uh, bad news first. I need to wake up early tomorrow morning. Best news, I get to start working on my birthday, which is tomorrow. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Incredible. That's unbelievable. Congratulations. What a birthday present. Yeah, it is. It's... Uh, I really didn't expect this. What does this mean for you and your family, then? Better life, which is what I've been hoping for, what I've been dreaming for. Yeah. Does Vivian know yet? No. That's a like quite for sure and obvious. Hello, Goo Goo. Congratulations, Vivian. Big news. What's the first thing you want to do? Just get out of this place. 
move to the flat or something. Yeah. I can't let them grow up here in this place. When I got the yes uh, after I left the office, it was, it just, it, it felt like I was taking a huge load of stuff just off my shoulders. So it, it's a big change for me. I'm still going to make it, I'm still going to do it. It's been a pleasure meeting you. Take care. Best of luck, OK? <laughs> OK, thank you. Take care. <laughs> See you later, little man. Bye-bye. See you later. She wants to give you a hug. Oh, do I get a hug? Yeah. <laughs> I'm really pleased that Hardest at least has made a positive change. I'd come here hoping to see a rainbow nation, but there's clearly some way to go. Integration is happening, but only in pockets. And I'm surprised it's the poor Afrikaners who feel they don't belong in South Africa anymore. Essentially, black and white people are victims of apartheid and they're still feeling the effects of it. It's a, a problem that's affected poor, rich, white and black. Do you think that you're a victim of apartheid still? Definitely my generation paying a price. Paying a price for our forefathers. South Africa's past is still haunting it. But it won't be like that always. Change takes time. It really does. Happy? Very happy. I look 10 years younger. It's amazing. Nice work, eh? Thanks. Bye bye. See you later, guys. Bye. Always look to the trees and to the sky. Remember us then. <laughs> Too. It's a bit weird um, seeing them react the way that they have to me. And it's a. I, if I'm going to be really honest, I feel a bit strange leaving. I mean, not that I want to stay here, but. You know, I'm going home, and I know what I'm going home to. And um, they're staying here, I mean, staying here in this. You know? This is how kids play here. This is the reality for them here, and good people. Really good people. My time in Coronation Park and Joburg has come to an end. The people I've been living with are in a very difficult position but they still have made me very welcome. And that's important. Thank you so much. Okay. Take care, OK? I will. During the years of apartheid, I wouldn't have even been allowed to step foot in this park. And that is progress, at least for me.